Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the City Council and successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency Council meeting in San Carlos, February 9th, 2015. Would you please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Uh, are there any changes to the order of the agenda? No changes from uh, staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. All right. Any council members wishing changes to the order of the agenda? All right. Um, Mr. City Attorney, do we have a report from closed session? Yeah, at the special meeting, we had a closed session, and the council's authorized um, City Attorney to initiate litigation. Thank you very much. Okay, on to council communications. Um, why don't we start with Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll uh, be brief on each of these because as I was listing them, I realized I had uh, quite a number on usually so tonight. Um, the council uh, hosted a, uh, a dinner for some local residents who were kind enough to uh, purchase a dinner from the council at last year's San Carlos Educational Foundation Spring Fling. We did that uh, uh, week ago Saturday, and uh, uh, I learned, uh, based on Cameron's efforts, who did a fantastic job cooking the main course, that parsnips are actually really cool vegetables. I had never had them before. Um, but everybody had a great time. More importantly, the folks who, uh, who uh, bought the uh, item had a great time, and that's, that's really all that mattered. Um, the, uh, 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 we all, I also had an opportunity last night uh, with my wife to attend the Healthy Cities uh, Perfect Pairings fundraising dinner uh, for their uh, tutoring program in San Carlos. That was their first one, and actually it came off, I think, fabulously uh, at Gusto's and um, uh, Positano's. Uh, really, really good food, great time, uh, sellout crowd. Um, on Saturday, I had the opportunity to be a judge for the local uh, chapter of the 4-H organization, doing judging for their program to encourage young people to uh, learn how to make public presentations and sell ideas, and that was a lot of fun. I actually learned a bunch of things about gardening that I didn't know, which I plan to put to good use in my garden. Um, the uh, last uh, couple of other things, um, uh, uh, this is an election year. There are two seats, mine and uh, the mayor's, that are going to be up for uh, re-election. And uh, something of a tradition that we established when I was on the school board is uh, uh, offered to meet with people uh, who might be curious about what it's like to be a council member or an elected official just to learn more about it, see if you want to throw your hat in the ring. That's something which I would love if the council as a whole wanted to offer to do that, but uh, let me just extend publicly if there's anybody who is curious, uh, I'd be happy to meet with you individually, um, or we could do it in a small group setting if there are enough people who are interested, and I can share you know, my perspectives with that. Um, so just feel free to get in touch with me on that. Um, the um, uh, two other last two items, I uh, had a good conversation today with Dimitri Vandelos, uh, who you recall made a presentation to us a little while ago uh, over some concerns about transparency in the uh, way in which some planning commission items were handled uh, relating to new hotel zoning rules. And one of the things that came up that I, I'd actually like to suggest that we think about is uh, currently we have a, a, a distance rule that says when we're making uh, a land use change or there's some property change that's going on that we're involved in, uh, there's a certain number of feet away from the property that we, uh, we mail out notices to. Um, I'd actually like to ask that we, we look at expanding that whenever there's a significant, meaning multi-site property change, land use change being made. Um, in this particular instance, it probably would have resulted in more of the folks uh, who believe they'll be affected by hotel developments, um, knowing about the Planning Commission meeting so they could have shown up to, uh, to weigh in on it. Um, and it's really all a matter of critical mass, if you will. When, when you're changing something on a broad swath of property, I think it actually it, it behooves us to have a broader footprint of who we notify. So I'd, I'd like to submit that for the Council's consideration. And then um, lastly, um, uh, on uh, the Holly Street corridor, uh, as I think everybody knows, we have a lawsuit against the city that was brought by two residents objecting to, uh, among other things, the change in the no parking rules on, in the corridor that we took last July. Um, uh, we've made it clear that uh, uh, 
uh, where that suit is moving forward and until it gets settled one way or another uh, taking making changes to the situation is not something that is is in the interest of the community um, but there is one item that that I'd be curious about I'd like to find out from staff uh, whether or not if we were to uh, choose to do so if um, uh, lowering the speed limit along that corridor to a residential level of 25 miles an hour is that something we can even do and that is I don't know the answer to that because it is an arterial and there may be separate rules for that so I'd like to actually see that because uh, see the answer to that because I think that that is something that we might consider doing uh, even uh, as things currently stand thank you mr. mayor all right thank you mark uh, Matt I really don't have anything uh, I just wanted to comment because Mark asked the question, uh, you'll note that University Avenue in Palo Alto is more lanes, broader corridor, speed limit, 25 miles an hour. It's residential. So I would guess that it could be done. Jeff, is that something that we need to bring up as an agenda item, or is it something that staff can study? Or what, what, what do you need any particular direction from us? Well, I think when it comes to an agenda item, we're always looking for direction from uh, the council. Uh, in terms of this seems like a, a rather straightforward question that we could uh, simply answer, and, and I could let the full council know what the answer is to that question in terms of the you know any laws governing how speed limits are set as they would apply to Holly. Okay, great. Uh, that was it, Matt? All right. Bob? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, as... Mr. Robert said uh, we did some cooking, and last night uh, we did some eating. So uh, that just about covers it. Uh, I'll have some meetings coming up with uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water, which we're going to hear from tonight. But uh, the last two weeks, I didn't have anything beyond, uh, I think, those two things. All right. Thank you. Um, Cameron. Uh, so, yeah, I uh, um, really enjoyed participating in the um, dinner that Mark hosted. Um, I also attended with a number of my colleagues the um, San Carlos Citizen of the Year um, banquet that was put on by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this year honoring um, Robert and Barbara Bledsoe. It was a really nice event. Also honoring um, Devil's Canyon Brewery as the uh, Chamber Business of the Year um, on Friday night. So, uh, And that is all. All right. Thank you. And uh, ditto for me. Uh took part in the meal serving, the, the meal eating, the citizen of the year. <laughs> Those are all great events. Um, the other thing I wanted to let everybody know about is that on Friday we had some visitors from Metapec, Mexico, which is one of our sister cities. And it was a, a, a couple, uh, Bertha, and pardon me while I look at my notes, um, it was Bertha Balestra and her husband, Eduardo White. And she is the president of the Metapec Sister City Association. And she's also the, also the author of about 20 books. And she gave us a gift. Actually, they gave us two gifts that I want to show you. I have to be, I have to be careful because one of them is very fragile. This is a, this is a handmade, hand-painted sculpture out of all clay and made by the locals in Metapec. And it was given to the city. Uh, by uh, Bertha and her husband, and I think it's just beautiful. And we're gonna we're gonna put it on display somewhere, I think. So uh, I'll just put it up here for the moment. And I have to be careful because one piece broke off when they were just taking it out of the <laughs> out of the package. And then the other was uh, uh, this book. It's kind of a coffee table book on Metapec that uh, Bertha wrote herself. And what I liked about it is that there are. Uh, there's a lot of drawings of local art, and then there's descriptions of what goes on, and one half of the page is in English and one is in Spanish, so it, it'll give me an opportunity to catch up on my Spanish. But anyway, uh, this, uh, these will be hopefully on display so the public can see them, and we're very appreciative of that relationship. It was very nice to meet them and, and tell them how, uh, how we work and learn about uh, Metapec. All right. Um, I think that's about all I have. Um, are there any comments by staff? Yeah, just a, a couple of quick ones, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, as you're all aware, we've been uh, in the midst of uh, outreaching the, to the community and conducting a community-wide survey. We've scheduled uh, two special council meetings 
uh, for February 21st, which is a Saturday, and February 25th. So there's two opportunities for the uh, community to come and, and participate and listen to the presentations to go over the results of those surveys and provide some uh, additional uh, commentary or feedback to the City Council. So hopefully uh, everyone uh, had an opportunity to go on Shape San Carlos or participate in one of the three uh, community forums or got a call for the survey, but if they didn't and they still uh, would like to get involved in the process and let the uh, council know uh, their feelings on the topics that we put before them and anything else that's on their mind, those will be the opportunities on the 21st and the 25th. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Next, we're going to move on to public comment. Uh, persons wishing to address the city council on matters not on our agenda tonight may do so. Uh, each speaker is limited to two minutes. There is a little device up there with green, yellow, and red lights. Uh, the green light goes on. You can start speaking, and when the yellow light comes on, you've got about 30 seconds to wrap it up. Um, the balance of the public comments uh, of any speakers have, uh, if they don't speak very long, and there's a number of people that want to speak on a certain issue, can be, um, can be called at the end of the council meeting. Um, now, if the item that you are speaking on is not on the agenda, please be advised that the City Council may briefly respond to the statements made or questions posed as, as allowed under the Brown Act. City Council's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention and have the matter placed on a future city agenda or more comprehensive action or report and formal public discussion, discussion and input at that time. All right. I have... Let's see, I've got just three. Well, the first person is Bill Barons. Mayor and Council, I, I want to apologize for having to read to you my statement, but I do want to try to stay within my allotted two minutes. That's quite all right. My name is Bill Barons. I represent 24 members of the Homeowners Association at 793 Elm Street. I testified at your public hearing 14 months ago in December 2013 when you considered changes in the solid waste collection charges. I left the meeting disappointed because I learned that the franchise agreement with Recology defines every apartment with five or more units as multifamily. And every multifamily is classed by definition as a commercial account. So your hearing in 2013 did not apply to the service that we received. But I left the meeting satisfied because in the staff report was this statement, and I quote, with this option, it is recommended that further research be conducted on the commercial rate structure during 1914, during 2014, with the intent to present council with several multi-year options for cart rate alignment as part of the 2015 rate process, end of the quote. I looked forward to the hearing last December. Disappointed hardly describes my feeling when I downloaded the entire staff report only to find nothing regarding commercial rates. In fact, the staff report reads very similar to the quote I read, except it recommends further research on commercial rates in 2015. Why am I so concerned? Last year, we, this homeowners association, paid $5,906 for solid waste collection. Two years ago, a residential 96-gallon black cart cost a customer $93 and a commercial customer $5 less, $88. Now the rates have flipped. A commercial costs $20 more than a residential cart of the same size. Over the past two years, the charge for a residential 96 gallon cart has been reduced 27%. If our costs had been reduced the same, we'd save about $1,600 a year. Or look at it this way. Next door to us on Olive Street is a four unit apartment building. The collection truck empties its 96 gallon cart and the charge is now $68 each month. The truck then pulls around the corner and empties our 96-gallon cart, and we pay $88 a month for essentially the same service. Both residential properties, both 96-gallon carts with $20, I can't make any sense of that. 
I'm here tonight to ask that you give specific instructions to your staff to include in its next solid waste rate study the evaluation of commercial rates that was promised in 2014. If that can't be done, you can solve my problem by calling an apartment house regardless of its size what it is, a residential property, not a commercial property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Behrens. Mr. Mayor, just as an update for the City Council, um, you did the Council did authorize such a study and that study is currently underway and we expect a agenda item before the City Council by the end of May of this year. All right. Thank you. Next speaker is Priya Joseph. Hello. Uh, so I wanted to talk about four items. Item one, nothing like, nothing's more motivating than being called aggressive on a Saturday morning when you haven't even opened your mouth yet. But I was pretty pleased to meet with Bob Grassilli. Uh, although it was the hardest to get hold of, uh, it was much easier to get hold of Jerry Hill, your endorsee. Uh, you have Silicon Valley people on your council, so there's this notion of hippo. Hippo, which is not, you know, it's not the highest paid person's opinion that matters, but it's actually the best opinion that counts. So look for diversity in opinions. If there's, you know, something that somebody looks at in a new way, appreciate that. It's not about, you know, somebody telling you what to do. That was something I wanted to say. The second item, uh, I sent you guys emails. If you read it, awesome. If you didn't, <laughs> bear with me as I, you know, repeat what I emailed. So on January 23rd, uh, the Redwood City City Council uh, actually bent back on their decision on four lanes on Farm Hill Boulevard to three lanes based on public safety concerns. I would like you guys to take inspiration from that. There also, the staff actually, much like our own city, strongly wanted them, you know, just pushing them to do four lanes, which was, you know, not safe for the residents. That was item two. Um, item three, there's a new person who's moved on Holly. Ironically, her name is Holly Jones. Uh, she has a two-year-old son. Her home is uh, three doors down from the 76 station. Uh, so in as such, it's so overwhelming when you move on to Holly. But there was one observation she made which sort of resonated with a lot of us. Uh, it was the fact that, uh, you know, when people merge, they are so confused. So if you can do anything about the signage, I know it's been brought up a bazillion times. Uh, you know, it didn't take you long deliberation to do the ordinance, but here we are six months, seven months, eight months, nine months down the line to do some remediation. Just a signage change would help. Number four, really quickly, uh, uh, I would like you guys, if you already looked at the petition, that's awesome. Uh, but, you know, some people have said in meetings that they haven't. Uh, do go and take a look. There are two of them. One is on Move On, the other one is on I Petition. So we address all kinds of all parties goes across the cross section. You can see there are six uh, items there, and you will see. You know they're not like rocket science things that you want to address. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we have one more. Nolan Welch. Thank you. I'm currently a huge. I'm currently a hero registered contractor, and we've been very successful in providing energy efficiency solutions to homeowners in communities that have adopted hero. We have also been able to expand in those communities by hiring locally. Uh, we do most of our work in Foster City and Menlo Park because they have hero, although we reside here in San Carlos. Uh, we would like to have the opportunity to do the same in San Carlos. Uh, so I'm here today to ask that to ask that you consider the adoption of the HERO program. Not only will you be providing a, a voluntary financing option to your residents, which is always a good policy, you will also be you will also enable local economic stimulus in the form of job creation and generate a lot more revenue for the city because HERO registered contractors pull a lot more permits in jurisdictions that have adopted HERO. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welch. All right. Anyone else uh, like to address? Um, you had, I'm a little confused, you had, uh, well, you had 8A as well. Did you also want to speak on this item? Sure. You want to wait? All right. Are you, you have two items to talk on, though? One is not on our agenda? Okay, go ahead. 
My comments are uh, laudatory and apologetic. They are laudatory because I was here on, oh gosh, I was here on December the 8th and when you had your um, council uh, reorganization. And you expeditiously handled that within 20 minutes. I'm apologetic because the following night, two or three, I can't remember exactly, members of the, of the San Carlos City Council came to Belmont. And we held you in thrall for um, one hour and uh, ten minutes, I think. Maybe there was eight minutes of public comments. But uh, unfortunately, Belmont doesn't move as expeditiously as you folks. And why it took 60 minutes to reorganize uh, the city council there beats the hell out of me. But um, I wish they'd follow your good example. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. Okay. Uh, and you're also going to speak later on item 8A? That's okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, these are items considered to be routine and will not be enact or will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for a separate action. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I move to approve consent calendar items A through I and adopt ordinance 1480 an ordinance of the city council of the city of san carlos adopting amendments to the san carlos municipal code title 18 zoning consisting of modifications to sections 18.03.090 a3 18.040030 18040030d 18040501 18040052 18040050-F1B, 18040060B5A, 18050330-3, 18050330E2, 18050040F5, 18040060B3, 18040060B, 18050040F6C, 18060040A6, C, 18060030, 18050030-5, 18050030-4, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18060030, 18
18.23.240A, 18.20.040, 18.05.030E2B, and 18.05.030E2D, and adopt Ordinance 1481, Ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos, adopting amendments to Revenue and Finance Title Three, Chapter 3.36, Parking Exemption Fund of the San Carlos Municipal Code. Second. And uh, yeah. Yeah. some of them are here. I think we've got some oxygen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that was great. All right. All right. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. Please, no. <laughs> um, Crystal? Councilmember Casilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. All right. That was a yeoman's effort. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to item eight um, reports to council. Reports to council are updates on key city projects by city department heads and staff and city council subcommittees. They are informational in nature and no action will be taken on these items at this meeting. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, Jay Walter, public works director. Uh, tonight we have an update uh, from uh, Dan Child, general manager of Silicon Valley Clean Water, which as the council is aware is the wastewater treatment facility that all of our wastewater is collected and transported to. And so I'd like to call Dan up now and he has a presentation that he'd like to go through with you. Um, it's about what the agency has been up to and uh, what are some of the, the outlooks for the future. So I'll um, ask Dan to come up and uh, instruct him in the use of this clicker and we'll move forward. Perfect. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much for having me tonight. As you see, there are 54 slides there. I promise it's going to be quick. The first, we'll concentrate on the first few, then kind of fly through the pictures in the middle, and then talk again at the end. So I hope to be able to get through this in about 10 minutes. Um, just a quick update, when we started the, the capital improvement program at Silicon Valley Clean Water back in 2008, we had 131 programs, projects that we identified, and a budget of about $340 million. Two, or four years later, we came back and had found additional projects. We're up to 144 projects with a budget of about 520 million, or 420 million. Came back a year later and we had reduced the projects Actually, as part of your instruction, when we met with you back at that time, you asked us to look at things that we could cut back on, and we were able to do that, as well as we combined some projects. However, the budget grew to about $525 million at that time. Today, I'm not here to ask for more money for a change. Just wanted to kind of give you an update of what we're looking at. Um, we do anticipate that in the coming year, we will have to go out for another bond, and I will get into that here in a minute. Just... We're running out of money that we've already approved, but it is been built into rates that we talked about in the in the past. So there should be no new surprises in the in the coming year or two. If you look at the projects we've done, um, we started out with a lot of planning, a lot of design, and not a whole lot of projects being completed. And over the last few years, we've been able to gradually get more projects completed with fewer in design and fewer in planning. Now this year we've got a, a trend again that we've got a lot in planning and that ties to the conveyance system. The conveyance system is the pipeline and the pump stations that once your wastewater gets to our system that we pump it out to the, to the treatment plant. And that system needs a lot of work which we'll touch on towards the end of, the project, of this presentation. So this is just a quick pie chart. Uh, so far, we've completed about $68 million worth of work. We have $110 million that are going on right now and still have approximately 345000 to complete in the future. When we started, we anticipated this was going to take about 10 years. Well, we're eight, almost nine years into it now, and we're less than halfway through. So obviously, we were a little ambitious in what we thought we could get done at the time. Um, but you can, this chart here shows how much we've been spending each year, uh, and it's just gradually been increasing. And to date, we've got a cumulative of $199 million that we have invested in the infrastructure of, of the area. 
From a funding standpoint, we have obtained $126 million in bonds, about $48 million from the state revolving fund, which are extremely low interest loans. And recently the state changed their policy. It used to be that you could only get those loans for 20 years, so the payments would be about the equivalent of the 30 year payments. However, it was a shorter term, so it didn't cost you as much. However, the state now has changed to where you can get 30 year loans as well. So that's something that we will be evaluating as we go forward. And we've also received about $4 million in grants from the California Energy Commission for our cogeneration project and also an upcoming project that is a food waste to energy project. So right now this is a cash flow of what's going on. Um, we, the red on the left hand side is uh, bond funds that are available now. We anticipate those are going to run out sometime mid-summer this year. And at that point we'll have to decide how to continue to fund, whether we will use our line of credit that we maintain, whether we'll go for further SRF loans or future bonds is yet to be determined, but we do know that mid to late summer we're going to have to start using funds from another source than these bonds. So what have we achieved with all this money? Um, it's a question I've been asked a lot lately is, you're spending a lot of money, what, what have we done? And we've completed about 60 projects altogether, and I obviously don't have time to go through them all, but there's a few that are pretty key that I wanted to touch on. One is our solids dewatering. Part of the wastewater treatment process is to separate the water from the solid material. And in our facility, we have for years used this 1980 Andrich centrifuge that was a one-off centrifuge, the only one ever built. is built by a company called Contech at the time and it is uh, definitely dilapidated and not working very well. We've since that time installed rotary presses which use about one-fourth of the horsepower, um, allow us a lot more flexibility in what we're doing, are a lot quieter and cleaner than the centrifuge and a lot less maintenance on them because they turn at a very low speed. We've also installed motor control centers, updates to be able to take care of those and to, and to address the power needs rather than having the high power intensity of the centrifuge. Cogeneration is something that, that uh, SVCW has always had on site. We had an old 350 kilowatt engine that ran for 30, almost 35 years. Did us a good job. However, if you've ever been out to our facility, you would always see a flame coming out the top of the building where we were wasting methane gas. And it seemed like a shame for us to do that. So we've recently installed a gas conditioning system to better protect the engine so they don't wear out as fast. And we installed a new one megawatt cogeneration system. So approximately three times the generating capacity. That system will allow us to produce almost, well, on an average day, we'll produce a little more than half of our power if, if everything is running right, just from cogeneration of digester gas that comes out of these the digesters from breaking down the solids. The uh, engines obviously generate a lot of heat. Rather than just wasting that heat through an, a radiator like a car, we are using heat exchangers that grab that heat and it, we use it to heat the digesters, we use it to heat our buildings, and in the case where we need supplemental, we do have uh, boilers in the background as well that keep us going in those times when we have high heat demands. As I stated, the digesters produce the natural, they're the methane gas in the, that is used for cogeneration, and we've been able to clean all these digesters, refurbish them, coat them, and make sure they're in good shape for another 20 to 30 years of service. We've improved all the mixing systems in the digesters. And digesters, just a real quick kind of a graphic description, but they're basically giant stomachs. It's where all the solids go. It's just like if we eat, they are heated, they're mixed, and they produce three byproducts. They produce water, they produce gas, and they produce solids. And all three of those are beneficially reused by us in the with the water it just is treated again, the the methane is used for cogeneration, and the solids are sent to land application in up in Solano Can County, where they are used for uh, soil amendment to improve the farming up there. 
So try to get as much reuse out as we possibly can. We've also had to update our transformers in the plant, our entire power distribution system. When we built the plant back in 1981, the power distribution was actually based on a design from the 1940s, and the day it was installed was outdated, and we could not buy spare parts for it. So we've updated that and installed new maintenance or new control systems along with that so that we get a lot better power uh, control of our systems and our, our motors, uh, more high efficiency pumps. Oops, went one too far. We also installed three new standby generators. So if we lose power, we have adequate power to run the entire facility. We have three megawatts of power. So even during storm events, when we're, everything on the plant is running, we have the capacity of doing that. We had a project to repair our sludge thickeners, our, the biosolids in the material. And we had a really strange power outage where when the power came back on, for some reason, many parts of the equipment, many pieces of equipment in the plant actually ran backwards. And it ended up damaging these thickeners to the point that two of them could not be salvaged. We have four totally, and two of them were just totally destroyed. We decided it would make more sense to replace those units with what are called belt thickeners. They're much more effective and a lot less power consumption since we had to replace them rather than just repair them. And we reuse the tanks. This is a picture of a of the bottom of one of those gravity thickeners that we've gone in and stripped out, broken the walls out, and we're going to use it for the control room for the for the belt thickeners. So we're trying our very best to get the most use out of the existing facilities and not waste anything that was spent in the in the past. It's just another picture of that. So upcoming projects. We have a screening facility, the food waste program that I mentioned, the force main I mentioned, and I've got some pictures about those. Also, we're improving our filtration system, and reclaimed water is becoming a really big issue in, in throughout California as a, the drought is upon us, and no end is in sight at this point that reclaimed water may become a bigger part of our, of our process. And I just want to kind of plant the seed that we may be hearing more and more about reclaimed water in the near future. So influent screening basically is when stuff that comes in that's so big that the bacteria can't break it down, we need to remove it. If not, it causes damage. And we've got a history of these, what are called rags, which are all the, the solid material in the, in the system that gums up the equipment and ends up breaking it down. It takes a lot of manpower to pull this material out. It clogs up pumps and, and can be a real headache. We have a project that we're just starting right now that includes installing these automatic screens that allow us to pull the material out. At this point, we're installing the coarse screens to get the big stuff out. And down the road, we were going to refit these coarse screens into our new Headworks facility that is planned as part of the, of the system and add the fine screens so we'll be able to remove everything out in that, at that time. That's probably about five years out before the whole project is done. The food waste is an interesting project that we're doing with South Bay Waste Management Authority. They are under a mandate to remove organic waste from their garbage. And it's a real challenge for them. And one of the things they can do is get it into a digester. And we've evaluated the options. We've been working with them for almost five years now on this and trying to come up with the best solution. And did it again. I pushed too much. Yeah, OK. And what they've come up with is we found a way that they can remove those organic waste, extract them, send them down to us. We put them in the digester, break them down, and stabilize them, and we get more biogas off of that. They get divert a large portion of their solids from the, from the landfills, and we are in a position where we have a much better system for our rate payers. And what we're really hoping to do here is that by doing this, we think that there, we will be able to generate enough biogas to offset a lot of the costs for us and actually be able to low, keep rates down for the wastewater people, the landfill people, because they're not going to have to truck this material so far. We'll be able to save money for their rate payers, for the garbage people. So in the end, all the rate payers are going, hopefully will win by to bring this material to us that they will save on both the garbage and the wastewater side in their rates in the long run by, by us joining forces as special agents, 
special agencies that work together to solve a problem. So the really nice thing is we have a lot of digester capacity at Silicon Valley Clean Water, and we have room for this. So the capital and cost in, to install the equipment to do this is relatively low. We don't need to build new tankage. We don't need to build a lot of buildings. It's just basically equipment, and it's looking like a real promising option that we're going to be able to do together. The force main is, you've heard us talk about before, our force main is consists of 12-foot sections of reinforced concrete pipe. It ranges in size from 33 inches up to 60 inches. Um, the joints are every 12 feet, and it was laid in Young Bay mud. And Young Bay mud is basically a, has a consistency of pudding. There is no structural support in Young Bay mud. So this pipe is constantly moving depending on the different forces, and when it moves, we get leaks. Um, some of the pipe has also had some structural issues, and we'll get to pictures of this. Um, this was a leak we had about five years ago at, right at the San Carlos pump station next to the airport where the top of a valve blew out. It was quite a sight to see, as you can imagine, and the airport uh, was not thrilled about that one. But uh, that's one of the issues. We also had a situation where after a power surge, the power went out, we had a water hammer. You all have been told to shut off your water at home slowly. So you don't break your pipes. Well, this is what happens when something shuts off quickly in our system. That pipe is a 48-inch diameter pipe. It's just downstream of the of the San Carlos pump station, and it literally cracked that pipe in half. And the repair process for that was very elaborate. It took a lot of work to get that done. A very uh, technical effort to to bypass it and get that pipe put it repaired. We've also had pipes out in Redwood Shores near the treatment plant and up near uh, the Knob Hills Shopping Center over the years that have broken. You can see the houses in the background. You know, if it would have been 100 yards further up the line, it would have been in the neighborhoods. Uh, this pipe took a very elaborate uh, s clamping system to put it back together. Basically, we put a, a bracket on both sides of the joint and pull it back together put the O-ring back in and uh, hold it together so that it can't come apart again. However, in, in the governor's base situation, we went one step further. On the bottom left, you'll see there's a, 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 a clamp there. And that's actually designed so that when, when the pipe moves again, because there was a crack in the bell of the pipe, that when it moves again, that that fiberglass piece will hold it together and contain the flow so it doesn't leak anymore. The last one we've had is at the treatment plant itself. On the very left you can see a wall there. That's the treatment plant. The treatment plant's built on piles so it stays solid. It doesn't move. The pipe is allowed to move and it settles. It's kind of hard to see. I don't know. Uh, the, just right there in the middle, there's a crack, and that crack is big enough that I could put my whole hand into that crack, and that's where it hit, the pipe had broken away from the, the treatment plant. And again, we put a very sophisticated system in place to be able to fix that. We had to bypass all the flow, so the little the pipe in front here allowed us to put a plug down in and force the water to go up over the top and come into the plant through a bypass system. So we've been looking at how to replace this pipe that is, is leaking from the Redwood Shores area. A year ago, we presented to the, to the Redwood Shores community four options for replacing this pipe. After further investigation on both the environmental standpoint and also from a public support standpoint, we eliminated the three that are dots, that they were just not going to be doable, which left one option of going digging up all of Redwood Shores Parkway for three years to be able to install this pipe. That was not a real cost-effective method or a very popular method with the residents, as you can imagine. So we were asked to go back and look at other alternatives. As of today, we have approximately 13 alternatives on the drawing board that we are still evaluating and looking at for what makes the most sense. Um, there's different ways of doing it. There's micro tunneling, there's open cut trenching, there's actually tunneling where a tunnel you go down underneath and you come up at the other end. 
um, and slip lining. There's a lot of different options, but these are what we're looking at right now from a CEQA standpoint and from a budgetary standpoint to determine what the best method is going to be to go forward. Um, at this point, we don't know the exact cost. We don't know the answer to, to this, but it's the reason I wanted to be here tonight more than anything is to let you know that we are still progressing. We are making headway in addressing these issues and that we're moving forward with CEQA and permitting and budgetary evaluation on those projects. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Any questions or? Uh, I think we do, Mr. Childs. Thank I you. Uh, uh, Mark Olbert has a question. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Um, actually, I had several questions. Um, let me just start. This one may actually be for, for our staff because it was part of our internal process. Um, Jeff or Jay, do you remember, actually this is before Jay's time, which capital improvement budget numbers did we use the last time we changed the uh, sanitary sewer rates? It, it, it couldn't have been the most recent one from December 2014, but I'm... Yeah. Councilmember Olbert, uh, Jay Walter, Public Works Director. Um, we, we didn't use the most recent capital improvement plan figures that Dan mentioned. However, we did have in there, in our calculations for rates into the future, a $100 million cost for nutrient removal, which is still something that is out in the future for the plant. So effectively, we had a very large amount of capital that had been forecast in the three-year rate um, study that we did and completed. Uh, okay. Uh, my next, that leads into my next question, which, which would be for Dan. But uh, is the increase in the capital budget numbers between 2012 and 2013, or actually end of 2014, of about $100 million, is that for the nutrient removal, or is that still to come? I believe that is still to come, Commissioner, okay. Councilman and, Albert. And, and, and last time I heard about this, we don't know for a fact that we have to make that investment, but the, the pot odds are that we probably will. I attended a meeting last week um, where that was discussed, and basically we were told to plan on it within a 10 to 15 year window. Okay. Um, the, um, let's see, um, the, the uh, uh, options for the force main, mm -hmm. which you had a set of options and all but one of them were eliminated and then that one got eliminated because it would involve destroying Redwood Shores Parkway or, or just... Uh, it, it's not totally, it is, the Redwood Shores Parkway it's still is on the list. still on the list. Um, what, what is the... Uh, in a nutshell, what was the primary reason why the other options were rejected? Uh, one was due strictly to the fact that nobody had ever done it before, and that was to put a pipe in the levee itself. Okay. And when we looked at that and just the risk that it came with, the, the SVCW Commission said we don't want to take that risk. Uh, two of them were environmental, just uh, putting pipelines in waterways and environment. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, when they look at options, look anything that in the water, they ask the question, is there an alternative? And if there's an alternative, they don't care how much it costs. If there's an alternative to stay out of water, you stay out of water. So from, from that standpoint, they eliminated those two. And, and would I be correct in assuming that the options that are being looked at currently are likely to be more expensive than the ones that we originally had? Uh, the Redwood Shores Parkway alignment was one of the more expensive ones at that point, and I would say that they... I'm sorry, I, I relative, let me, let, relative to what's in the budget, let's put it that way. Is, it, is the budget likely going, to go up? It's or? going to go up some, but I have no idea, and it, um, I don't... I wish I knew the answer to that right now, but I anticipate they will be more expensive than what was in the budget at that time, yes. If for... Well, maybe I can clarify for one major reason also is that Construction costs have skyrocketed in the last two years compared to what we were doing, it, you know, back at that time when things were considerably better for the builder and for the the payer than the buy, than the builder. Which actually leads into my last question, which is, um, and if you actually have an analysis someplace that you can make available to us offline, that'd be fine. 
But in terms of the last incremental step of the capital budget, where it went from 420 million to 525 million, what, what's what's the variance analysis on that? What drove the 105 million dollar increase? What drove that? Um, the biggest part was we had adjusted from 2007 dollars. I shouldn't say the biggest part, but a big part was we adjusted. We had not made any inflationary adjustments from $2,007 when we did the original, so up to 2013, six years of costs. Um, we also had uh, more information about what we were doing and some of the projects had included, but I probably, that's all I can think of right off the top of my head, but I, there's definitely analysis that I can get to you on. And what's, what I don't know anybody else. I would be interested in seeing that. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, I presume we'll have a discussion after the question phase? Yes, we will. Thank you. All right. Is that it? Yep. Uh, Matt. I just had uh, one quick question regarding, and you may or may not know this, but uh, I heard a presentation up in Sonoma and what they were doing with their sewer plant concerning regeneration and uh, you, you spoke about taking gas, you know, off off the uh, lines like that. So I was just curious if you're aware of what they're doing and the extent of what they're doing in Sonoma. I am not a, personally aware of exactly what Sonoma is doing. Um, I will check into it. Yeah, you it'd brought be, it up. Uh, worthwhile probably to check into. I, I know uh, – when I was at this, I was at this conference on you know green technology and all all that kind of thing, um, and it seemed to me they were generating enough gas to run their uh, not just the plants' vehicles but the uh, some of the county vehicles, so they were they were able to get quite a bit off of it. And one of our uh, parts of our evaluation on the food waste to energy portion is what to do with that gas. Does it make sense to continue to generate electricity or use it for fuel for vehicles, that is one of the options, especially when gas was more expensive today, it's not quite as good a deal, but you know, we, none of us anticipate gas is going to stay this cheap forever, I don't think. So um, that is a technology. We also, SVCW for decades now has worked very close with Stanford University on experimental things with their doctorate students, and we've done several different experiments over the years, and one we're actually working with them right now is where they take the digester gas and they have developed a bacteria that consumes the gas and excretes plastic. Wow. So there's lots of neat things going on and we are looking at a lot of those but um, it's... Uh, Stanford just got a grant uh, on s some type of uh, regeneration s we, study. So. We are actually working with them on that work as well. They're building a, a research facility online and have talked to us about assisting them with operations of that. So. And just one more thing. I know, you know, Bob's retired and there's good golf up that way, so you could send him up to look at the Sonoma plan. He, Thanks. Could, Thanks. he could get in a game. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Great. Any All other right. Um, any other questions from my fellow council members? Yes, I actually, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had uh, one quick follow on question, um, uh, which I should remember and I don't. Dan or somebody, can you remind me what's our percentage interest ownership in Silicon Valley clean water? I believe it's 17 percent. Seven, so we're essentially right. responsible for 17 percent of 524 million dollars. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, seeing none others, thank you, Dan. Thank you um, very much. We do have a public uh, speaker request card. Uh, Mr. Keenan, did you want to come up and talk? Well, the reason I came down is I was interested to see Dan's presentation, and it's very efficient uh, from an engineering perspective, uh, as, as I would expect. He's, he's right on the ball there. Um, unfortunately, as I told the City Council of Belmont last year, the presentation isn't avail made available online as a semi-staff report, so members of the public don't know whether they want to come to the meeting or, or whatever, and I, I'm encouraging Belmont to ask for this presentation in advance of the meeting. We don't even have this presentation online after the meeting. I mean, the, the presentation of a year ago. So um, if you Google Silicon Valley uh, clean water, you get something about 150 ducks. Um, 
whatever, there's a little program there. Um, so what I'm interested in is what about the financing of the 525 million? Um, in Belmont, I believe we have a $250 per household, which helps us uh, finance um, um, our share, which is a little bit smaller than 17, well, quite a bit smaller than 17%, I understand. Um, so what happens um, if the 525 million um, is, is a lowball estimate. In fact, our finance director said uh, last year in July, it is likely the cost of CIP will increase with recent estimates topping 700 million. So we're, we're up in, if, if that's the case, we're all going to be scratching our head about how to find our share of the money. And we've got other infrastructure problems up there. So um, if there's a possibility of 100 million, I think it should be on the CIP update summary as a contingency. And um, I'm interested that maybe there'll be some discussion tonight about um, how you're going to uh, participate in the funding of the, of the CIP. I'm going to be interested to hear that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. Would anyone else like to speak on this issue? All right. Um, discussion? Uh, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, uh, the last speaker kind of touched on something that was probably is probably the heart of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I did have one other um, uh, brief comment to make, however, for, for our staff. Uh, in the future, I would really appreciate not having these reports being as verbal only, sort of echoing part of what the speaker said. Uh, an $18 million increase in our costs um, from, you know, year over year is not something that I think should be verbal only. Um, uh, I, I would also suggest that in the future when there are those kind of changes that we actually work with the, the, uh, the joint venture to make sure that there is a variance analysis that actually walks through what's driving the, the change in the costs. Um, because that's a fairly significant sum of money. If staff were to come back to us and say, by the way, we just increased your capital budget by $18 million, have a nice day, um, and I'm being facetious, Dan, I know you're sensitive to this, the issues here. We, we would ask a lot of questions, and we would want to have a lot of answers on, on what, what was causing that. Um, I, uh, and that really leads into my, my next comment, which is um, I really hope my colleagues will join me in asking our staff to, to really dig into this pretty deep. Uh, I am, as I was listening to various comments, and I appreciate Jay's observation that we essentially had a fairly big cushion in the, the earlier rate increase, uh, I was part of voting on that rate increase, and I actually was, had mentally allocated that cushion to pay for the $100 million um, nutrient removal, which I, it, we've all known is very likely to happen. Um, so the fact that there's another $100 million at least on top of that, and maybe some more on top of that, is a source of grave concern for me. Um, I, it's not an insurmountable problem, but it's it's frankly, a surprise, and, and I would, uh, you know, I don't care for those kinds of surprises. Um, and uh, uh, my response is, uh, rather than, you know, me or any of us individually digging into it, I think we need to have staff dig into it and come back with, with some more information for us to say, what does this mean for San Carlos? What are the processes that's leading this? What are the risk factors? Uh, you know, what's, a, what's our own assessment of the risk factors on what, could, what the final cost could end up being? Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Is there, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is... You wanna, you wanna try to get some consensus? For well, this? I actually just, you know, does anybody else feel the way I do? Anybody else agree with uh If with nobody Mark does, then there's no more work for staff on it. Well, um, let me speak to that then. Um, and Jay, feel free to jump in here if you'd like. Uh, to correct me at some point if I get this wrong, but our process has been uh, to continue on with our with our rate setting structure, and every time we bring a rate uh, adjustment to the council to be able to provide the most up to date information. I think still, if if I'm not mistaken, Dan, some of the projects and changes that you mentioned still need to be voted for and approved by uh, the Clean Water Board, as well as some of the proposed funding mechanisms. And uh, that will come back as the board 
approves things, then that'll start. It'll trigger decision points for the city council and all the various agencies. Correct? Yeah. If I if I may, the 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 concern I have, and and this is always with these joint ventures. We, we are only a seventeen percent voting interest. Okay, so so uh, it's not up to us. Um, but the process that you've just outlined, Jeff, basically is an after the fact process. Um, if, if, for example, the council's w will was, we really want to direct staff to work with Silicon Valley Clean Water and, you know, through our representative uh, Bob on, on their board to hold down costs. That's something that we need to do before you come back to us and say, by the way, they just approved these projects. We need to increase rates by 25% by over the next two years. Um, so there are some choices here that we have to make, and when we make them is significant. And I guess another way of saying what I was saying a minute ago is I'm lobbying, urging us to investigate a little bit more now just to see what's coming down the pike so we can decide if we we want to give that kind of direction. Very good. I don't see it. I don't see an issue with us doing that. I think we stay involved. I know our public works directors member the TAC committee and is up to date on all the projects and uh, uh, the ongoing and the planned work so we can look at the numbers have our finance people sit down with them and prepare an item for the council in the future um, it's just a matter of timing it's something that we would be doing anyway uh, throughout the process so I don't see a lot more work for staff on this other than what we would already be taking on Do you need any specific direction from us or is this something that you're gonna well I think maybe just for the record the three Three head nods would do it, but um, like I said, this is something we're going to be doing anyway, so it's just a matter of timing. All right. Um, any support for that? Yeah. I'm, I'm, when I get a chance to talk later, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you, well, why don't you talk well, now? No, I, I, I'd want to make sure that the council understands that we're not uh, the four of us uh, that are down there, Redwood City, uh, West Bay, uh, Belmont, and San Carlos, um, even though it sounds like a rubber stamp, uh, it isn't, and Dan can shake his head because he knows that uh, every time he brings something to us, we have a, a, a pretty spirited discussion on some of this. And I know I my, myself have raised it, and I know uh, the other three members have also raised it. Of It's great to have the $525 million budgeted, but uh, maybe we need to look at ha have-to-haves and nice-to-haves. And we've, we've, we've talked about that, and Dan knows that. And uh, as was also mentioned, this is even though it's there, it has not been approved uh, that amount of money, and uh, the you know the board takes its responsibility seriously. And I would think that, and certainly I know Jay does his his due diligence. He he communicates with me every month or when we have our meetings to make sure that he has questions that that uh, come up on certain of these items. So uh, I just want to assure the council and the public that um, we are looking at some of these things. Some of the things that we have to do. We have to do, like putting in the 48-inch main and whatever. Uh, the deferred maintenance and this plant, as I think been mentioned, when I came on in 2005, there were no there were no reserves, zero. Uh, we have got uh, have set up a reserve policy so that at least in 25 years or 30 years, when we have to do it again, uh, we're going to have some some backup for it. But uh, this is um, it, it's a huge huge project in the last couple. As Dan said, the last we got away in the first few years. With some good prices, and the prices have and now gone the other way. But uh, fortunately, with Jay uh, 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 and his staff, I think they've done a great job. But I would agree with Mr. Olbert that uh, I think we we need to have more detail uh, brought to the entire council. And uh, if you know it wasn't an inordinate amount of work done by staff, I would certainly uh, go for that. Anybody else in agreement? Yeah, I'm in agreement. Yep, I think you've got full direction from us. All right, thank you. All right, on to new business. Um, item 9A, consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of 2015 general obligation, obligation refunding bonds for the purpose of refunding outstanding 2005 bonds and approving related documents and official actions. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Rebecca Mendenhall, Administrative Services Director. Before you tonight is the consideration of a resolution authorizing the refunding of the library general obligation bonds. Given the strong bond market and low interest rates right now, it makes sense to look at refunding. We met with Standard & Poor's last week, and today they reaffirmed our rating of AAA. 
That combined with the strong bond market means we should see interest rates for the refunding at historical lows. Our financial advisor, NHA, has estimated annual savings of close to 12 percent or a present value savings of $709,000. Craig Hill is here from NHA, as is our bond counsel, Chick Adams, from Jones Hall, if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Um, questions of Rebecca or the other gentleman here? Um, if I may. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So the it was seven hundred and ninety two thousand. You said um, is the total or the present value of the total savings? The present value is closer to seven hundred and ten. Seven hundred ten thousand, and so that is passed a hundred percent on to taxpayers through refund refunds in their um, property tax bill. Is that correct? Yes, they'll see savings of about twelve percent. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I I, I have one, Rebecca. Just what does a twelve percent translate into in terms of a Individual homeowner. About $6 a year. About $6 a year. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, if, if I just, just Thank you. i just make a brief comment. I uh, just want to thank staff for st and, uh, staying on top of this opportunity. Um, and uh, we always like saving money. All right. Thank you. Um, any members of the public like to speak on this issue? All right. Um, Mr. Mayor, yes. I, I move to adopt resolution 2015-12, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the issuance and sale of 2015 general obligation refunding bonds for the purpose of refunding outstanding 2005 bonds and approving related documents and official actions. I second. <clears throat> All right. Any discussion? All right. Crystal? Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. All right, on to nine, item uh, 9B, discuss, uh, discuss a banner replacement for inclusion in fiscal year 2015-2016 budget. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. City banners were installed in 2011 on polls and on Key Streets as part of the newly adopted City of Good Living marketing and branding campaign. Street banners are used in a number of cities around the country as a colorful and inexpensive way to communicate a city's brand and civic pride. Banners are meant to enhance our city by adding vibrancy and it livens up our streetscape and strengthens a sense of place and identity. We've been told anecdotally that the banners make people feel welcome and uh, when new newcomers come to the city of San Carlos. As the banners have weathered and faded, um, there's a need to replace and refresh with new designs and promote the city and the business community. Staff estimates the cost of the banner design and uh, printing installation would be about $30,000. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the City Council provide some direction to include the replacement of the banners in the mid-year funding cycle for the FY 2015 and 16 budget. And that concludes the presentation. We're available to answer any questions. All right. Questions of Mr. Save? Just quick. So this was pulled out separately, I think, because we asked you to when we were looking at the budget. That's correct, yes. All right. Um, uh, Cameron. Uh, thanks, Al. Um, you mentioned redesign. Um, can you talk a little bit what you envision? Or is it, are we staying consistent with the kind of the logo design that we have, or um, are you going to kick off a new design process? And what's sort of the evaluation for, um, what's the evaluation process for choosing the design? Well, what we did before, and I, and I think that um, we ought to look at, perhaps a new design and a new fresh perspective on it. And the way we approached it before is we had some folks from the Economic Development Advisory Commission set up a subcommittee and I think we had somebody from the Chamber of Commerce with city staff and we went out, did an RFP for a local design firm and um, worked as a group, made a selection and then made a re that group, that subcommittee made a recommendation to the city council. So that's kind of the process that we followed before. It seemed to work pretty well. 
So, I mean, do you envision and should we imagine that, you know, there's going to be this kind of three to four year cycle of redesigning the banners on an ongoing basis or um, are we going to stick, you know, what, what's your vision here? Do you, are we going to stick with kind of a look and feel for a decade or um, <laughs> it, it seems, you know, it, I, I, having served on the Economic Development Commission at the time, you know, it was a pretty long process to come up with that, that branding. So. I'm not saying it's a bad idea to redesign them. I'm just wondering, um, you know, are we going to go through that long process every time? No, I think the brand is is in place. I think the the brand is solid. I think it it's it is a decade long brand. I believe. Um, I feel very strongly about it personally. I think it's been very effective. So. From a brand, the reason that I think it took so long is because of that, and because right. all the research that went into it. I think this is more of an ancillary, you know, um, offshoot of that, and it's more about um, getting the brand out there, and it's another method of marketing, very inexpensive way to do it. And it's nice to refresh these things every few years. I think. I think personally, again, that these the design that we have is is a very good design, mm -hmm. but. It's not to say that we couldn't refresh it and do something new and different. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, this is a question for my colleagues. Uh, I appreciated Matt's uh, reminding us about it having been pulled off, but I had a follow-on question. As I recall, we had quite a bit of discussion about whether this should be included in the budget or not. Um, what was the general sense of why we asked to have it brought back? Not the fact that we had it brought back, but why? I, I, I had thought we were there was not strong support for doing it, and it was pardon me, there was not strong support for doing it by the council, and it was staff who basically was like, well, we, we would like to come back and revisit this issue. Well, I can I can take a stab at that. I Go mean, ahead, unless the mayor wants to. Well, but, uh, um, you know, I, I think that what there was a, a good deal of discussion at the budget hearing, and I think that what we came to a very close vote at that meeting, and I think that, you know, um, it, it was sort of a swing vote moment there, although it did uh, get taken off the budget. Um, so the, the final vote was, uh, I believe it was a 3-2 vote to, to not support it. But I think after that discussion, there was some... Um, interest in bringing this back. We heard ancillary, you know, interest in bringing this back and just taking another uh, shot at it, essentially. Did one of us uh, just did one of us ask to bring it back? I, be I believe I did. It was the yeah. council that asked to bring it, asked yeah. to have this brought back and revisited. It. It's just been some time since then okay. uh, because you know the banners didn't need to be immediately replaced, so this wasn't a, an urgent item, and we got busy with. A number of other things, and so this is actually just slid on the agenda for a while. Fair enough. All right. Anybody else uh, have any questions of Al? All right. Uh, what? That's on another one. Uh, any members of the public wish to address us on this item? All right. Nobody. Mr. Mayor, I move to request staff to include the banner replacement for consideration in the fiscal year 2015 to 2016 budget. Is there a second? Well, I guess I'll second it. You can do that. All right. Um, Maybe I can speak on behalf of the motion. Absolutely. So um, I will follow you. <laughs> I was uh, I was initially uh, with um, a lot of my colleagues in, in being a critic of the banner program. And I think I was looking at it from a perspective of return on investment. You know, it, it does seem uh, relatively expensive to be spending $30,000 on banners. And it's hard to imagine, you know, that the money, that there's a direct connection between that and given that we basically make, uh, you know, one cent on the dollar for every um, uh, sales tax transaction in town. Um, you know, the idea that we would get that money back seemed a little dubious. I would have to say that... Um, it came out of a mindset, and I think we've all been in a mindset, that economic times have been tough and we got to save um, every dollar that we can. And I think, in general, that's the right approach. However, I do feel that in the last you know, year or two, it really feels like something has kind of tipped in the um, economic momentum of our town. Um, and the level of development, new businesses moving into the downtown, new businesses moving into the east side, 
um, feels like there is a general momentum and there is energy out there. Um, and so, and given that, and given the, uh, the increased um, economic development related revenue that's coming into the city, I do think um, trying to um, continue to brand the city and maintain um, a sense of place uh, that's commensurate with a lot of the investment that's going in in Redwood City and other places is an important thing for us to do. So um, I, I've i kind of come around um, on the on the banner program, and I think, um, well, you may not be able to say we're going to get every dollar back that we spend on it. Um, I do think it contributes to um, our overall economic development plan, um, and I think it has an impact. Anybody else? Uh, yes, actually. Okay. Um, uh, I uh, uh, was not, I wasn't strongly opposed, but I was not supportive of this when we discussed it um, during the budget review cycle. Um, I remain unsupportive of it, uh, not strongly so. Um, I believe that, that uh, in this day and age in particular, uh, given the importance of e-commerce and online life, that if we were looking to spend some additional money, there are probably better places to spend the $30,000 uh, than on banners, which um, I still believe are not particularly well noticed um, or actually particularly much in the way of uh, a business attractant in our town or for our town. All right. Anybody else? Matt? I, I, I'm more of a mind to um, not – put it in the budget and see what kind of reaction we get because, you know, it's, uh, we don't really have much idea of their positive effect. And the best way to figure out if they mean anything to anybody is not put them up for a year. So I'll be voting against it, but only on that, with that thought in mind that it would be something that we try not having and, uh, see what kind of reaction we get. Okay, Bob? Uh, I was, uh, I think the uh, sort of the major opponent of this, I just, I, I just feel that people when they drive should be looking at the cars in front of them instead of the banners. But um, You mean their cell phone? Or their cell phone, right? And they're texting. But uh, I mean, I, I, think it, I think this is an item, and again, everybody has a personal opinion. I mean, I can go through a thousand budget items and you could Say, I like that one, I don't like that one, I like that one, I don't like that one. Um, this one, just for some reason, has hit a nerve in me, and uh, I just think it's a nice to have. And uh, even though we have the economic, and I certainly agree with my colleague, the economics of our area have gone up. Our budget's been in much better shape. Uh, but uh, in this case, I can't, as I didn't uh, months ago, I won't be supporting this item. Can, can I? Yeah. Given, given the comments that have just been made, I, I wonder if I might make a suggestion. Um, which is, you know, there is a proposal that the staff is working on to create a business improvement district. Um, and, you know, to me, the kinds of things that that business improvement district is going to do for downtown is, um, you know, beautification, landscaping, and I kind of put banners into that general category. So I wonder if I could persuade one of, one of my colleagues who is potentially softly unsupportive of this, if, if instead we modified it to say that we um, cut the budget in half and said that the other half of the budget would have to be paid for by the business improvement district, would anybody be willing to go along with that? Can I offer yes. a friendly tweak on that? Sure. Uh, rather than cut the budget in half, because I, I, I thought Matt's point was well taken about not knowing exactly what the impact of this is, and of course it's hard to tell with this kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, put the program, make make putting the program contingent upon finding that money. In other words, not just launching it, seeing if we can raise the other half, but basically say if we can't get commitments for half of it um, ahead of time, then we don't do the program. Yeah, I mean, the argument would be, the counter argument would be that, um, you know, the banners extend beyond just the core downtown. So, you know, that's why I'm kind of saying half of it would be paid for by the Downtown Business, business Association, and the other half would be paid for by the city to pay for banners in, in areas well, other than in the downtown. I'm willing to be flexible about us kicking in half of it. Yeah. I, I'm basically saying that, that I would just not like to see it, you know, half the banners put up and say, well, we couldn't raise the other $15,000, so we didn't do it. 
I'd, I'd rather have no banners if, if the business community is not willing to support kicking in some of the money for it. Right, I, and I think that's reasonable. That's what I'm proposing. I, oh, think, okay. I think the question to Al is if, if, if we did an amendment like that, um, would, um, would we be able to maintain the banner program under the current budget levels until we have a chance to see if we can get a business improvement district going? Or would they have to come down for some period of time? Um, I mean, they, they still have some life in them, so I think we could leave them up for a while and get through the, um, the downtown business improvement district uh, process and just kind of throw it out there. Um, if, if there's interest by the council, we could throw it into the mix and just say, hey, look, the, the city uh, would put in half the, the money, you know, if you guys are interested, as part of your, of your improvement district. Um, so I think they could they could certainly last for a little while longer, uh, and it's short enough to where we can get that business improvement district underway. I think Matt had his light on. Yeah, and then and then Mark. Number one, I'm not sure that half the banners are in the business improvement district area, whatever that's going to be. I mean, we haven't decided what that's going to be. I don't think. And number two, whether we're spending, you know, our money, which is the public's money, or half of half of it comes from our coffers and half of it comes from someone else's, uh, or the business improvement district that doesn't exist yet, uh, to me, it doesn't matter. I, I still think it's worthwhile going through the test of not having them and seeing. You know, if we get a bunch of emails about where the banners go, that tells us something. If if nobody seems to notice, that tells us something else. So, uh, Mark, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Matt, I, I I I think that's that's very accurate. Uh, I would just the reason I thought that I found Cameron's proposal attractive is it's sort of a bit of a reverse. It's it's going to the business owners and saying ahead of time, hey, if you think that this is valuable and you're willing to actually put money in on it, not just tell us it's valuable, you're willing to just put some of your hard-earned money into it, then we'll sort of, we'll match it effectively, mm -hmm. okay? Right. That, that's another way of doing market research. It's not waiting for emails to come in of people saying, why'd you take the banners down? It's, it's saying, are people willing to put cold, hard cash behind the belief that they actually think it's worth something? But I see where you're coming from. It's just a different way of doing it. Well, since I'm one of the people that was one of the proponents of this, uh, and it's an outgrowth of the Economic Development Advisory Commission, and I think I was on the commission when, we, when this idea was uh, was thought of, uh, I, I agree. It's really difficult to measure passive advertising. Um, but it says a lot about the city. It says that, uh, you know, we are proud of the city, that we want businesses to come here. There's no way to measure how many businesses have decided to come here because they saw a banner. I mean, see seem kind of a silly thing to say, but when, if, when you're looking for a place to park your business, you look to see what sort of messages of invitation are out there for uh, your business. Is this city open to do business? And I, I can't tell you if Devil's Canyon came here because of the banners. Probably not. You know, it was probably because there was a great, uh, a, a, a great space that became available or, or some uh, auto repair shop. But when you're looking for places to relocate, you look at the, the atmosphere of the city. To me, this is part of the atmosphere. Is the atmosphere inviting? Is it not inviting? I think this is, a, uh, this is really a very inexpensive way of saying, we're proud of the city. Please come here and do business. And I think it's, it would be a mistake for us not to have some sort of arrangement, whether it comes half from business or all from the city or something. I think we get money back from this. I, I really do. Um, I just think it, it, it's in light of the fact that we have uh, turned the city around in the last few years and we've saved a lot more money in the last year or so than we thought we would and our budget is doing well. I think this, to me, this is no time to stop. Uh, this is an important, uh, a small but very important cog of, make, of sending the message out to enterprises that San Carlos will always be open for business and that we want people to come here. We want, we want people to eat here and shop here uh, and live here and play here. All of those things, I think, are very consistent with our, our long-term and short-term goals. So however this uh, uh, measure gets put together, I think we should support it. 
Uh, Jeff? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll make my final pitch. I, I think uh, the council uh, has known my position on this. Uh, I think the mayor did a good job and, and uh, uh, Cameron in, in defending the motion. And I certainly understand the council member's reasons for not wanting to move forward with this right now. But something Matt said um, just a minute ago um, triggered a thought in my mind that I wanted to share with the council uh, before you voted. And that has to do with the tax revenue that, that the city receives and the expenditures primarily for which we spend our tax revenue on. Most of our expenditures are uh, designed to serve the residents of this community. Uh, over half the tax revenue uh, or just about half the tax revenue that the city gets to do that comes from uh, the business and commercial community. And this is you know, one of a very few number of programs that are really geared towards uh, economic development and business uh, development in general, in addition to sort of the quality of life and look and feel of the community, which I think benefits the businesses as well as the residents uh, equally. So you know, from a cost perspective, I just wanted to put that argument out there for the council to consider. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments, Mark? Uh, yeah, just briefly, I, I appreciate the comments that are being, a uh, comment on the question. I appreciate the, uh, the lively discussion on this one. Um, you know, uh, uh, I do feel San Carlos is open for business. Uh, I think we've always been a fairly business-friendly community. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, to, to the point about it being a relatively small amount of expenditure to do this, uh, I my main concern is I actually don't you know my gut tells me that it's actually not a terribly significant item, um, and that the money would be better spent someplace else. That's part of why I found Cameron's Cameron's idea attractive to see if the other business leaders are willing to put money behind it. Uh, my question basically is since we essentially had a motion and a second, and now we had would an you, amendment. Would you care to make an amendment? Or? Uh, well, I think you made the amendment. Okay. okay. Um, Can I amend my own motion? Oh, I hadn't thought it would that. be essentially a substitute motion um, based upon the discussion, and then um, there would be, need to be a new second for the substitute motion. Okay, so, so you can. So the short answer is yes, you can. <laughs> well, I'm happy to do that. Did you want to finish your comment? Or? Uh, the, my comment was done. That was the question. I actually feel happier if you did it, just because I think you have a clearer view of what you're trying to articulate. Yeah, I mean, what I would articulate is that um, the budget for banners be reduced by half and that staff um, seek to fill that reduced budget um, through the proposed business improvement district. Could, could I you, offer a, an additional suggestion yeah, to say absolutely. the business improvement district or some other outside funding source? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I don't care if the chamber does it or right. whoever. Yeah. All right. Do I have a second? Yeah, do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on the motion? All right. Crystal? Councilmember Grisilli? No. Councilmember Gokot? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving on to item 9C, consideration of introducing an ordinance updating the municipal code to include a vicious animal owner restriction. Um, if I may, I will uh, present from, um, from the dais to the right. Um, the, what you have before you tonight is a proposed amendment and uh, amended and restated animal control ordinance. Um, the, 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 the main changes to the ordinance are to add um, some provisions regarding um, further regulation of dangerous animals, to um, add some provisions regarding dog owner accountability and liability, um, some additional fee and licensing requirements, and to provide for uh, dog, um, dogs in outdoor dining areas consistent with um, a recently enacted state law. The, um, I'll take the last item first. The, the, the recently enacted state law um, authorizes or, or provides for regulation, um, provides for the way cities can regulate um, dogs in outdoor dining areas. Um, but the, the city has a choice. Um, you can either prohibit dogs in outdoor dining areas completely or enact the state law. So 
um, we have allowed um, dogs in the outdoor dining areas on a case by case basis by the restaurant owner. But um, this this is, I think, intended to create a uniform um, statewide rule if you're going to allow dogs. The main um, the the cleanup um, of the ordinance um, came as came as a result of just um, some of the city's recent experience um, with uh, dangerous animals and how we handle them. And it, it seemed like since the ordinance hadn't been updated um, in quite some time, in over ten years, it was it was time to look at those issues and uh, and address them. Um, so the the council might. Um, uh, recall that we've had some recent problems with with animals and dangerous animals and that it became clear it, during that process that we had some deficiencies and that's this ordinance um, amendment isn't attempted to address that issue uh, a couple of um, issues I want to bring to the council's attention in the um, in the ordinance um, after um, it was posted. We um, there's a couple of typos that I wanted to just bring to the council's attention. They're very minor. Um, the first is um, at regarding the uh, age of animals that can be kept without a permit, um, and it's there's one reference to um, a change from six months to four months, uh, and then the there's one reference that that was changed to four months, but the very next paragraph, and I'm trying to find it since it's a, quite a long ordinance here. Um, Can you give the section number? Yeah, it's, I'm sorry, I just found it. It's section 6.04.320, keeping of other animals permitted. Um, so um, offspring of dogs and cats and under subsection B, the the text of the code had six months, and that section should have been changed to four months as section subsection A is changed to four months. The idea being there that um, keeping dogs that, that are a, a, a large number of dogs um, from um, multiple litters could become a, a nuisance, and we're trying to address and encourage owners who have um, dogs that have uh, bred or, or cats that have bred to um, take uh, very affirmative steps to um, remove those animals from the household during that time. There's a typo, um, a code reference at section 6.04.130 in the last line of that section. It says um, it refers to liability outlined in section 6.04.130. 091, it should be 0 0.095. And, uh, oh, it's just the, the section so it should say 0 0.095 and yes. not 0 0.091. Yes, oh. there was just a typo there. And then under um, section 6.04.380, I'm uh, um, recommending a change in the text beginning at um, line 2 after the word uh, permittee, just before the, where the red line is, um, if you're looking at the red line version, instead of saying um, after permittee, um, including permittee of a dangerous animal, that would not be included, and we'd change it to premises of each dangerous animal or other permittee at least once each year. So we're trying to focus that section on just dangerous animals. And those are the suggested changes um, to the ordinance. And I'm available for any questions the council may have. All right. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, Jeff and I actually had a pretty extensive discussion about this ordinance uh, going through it. So um, let me just ask a, a few questions here to make sure they're on the record and that the community is aware of them. Um, I noticed we added a section on liability, so spelling out the liability of a dog owner. And when I saw that it was added, the first thought that occurred to me is, hmm, I wonder why it wasn't in there before. So, Well, the, the answer to that is um, the 2005 ordinance is, a, um, is based on a model ordinance that's circulated throughout the county. And uh, so the city uh, adopted that model ordinance, and that was what was presented at the time. Um, 
that was something that we noticed too when we were reviewing the ordinance that we didn't really have an explicit statement that says, hey, if if your um, animal um, harms someone or their or their animal, we wanted to have a specific statutory provision for that. It also covers a situation where if the uh, if someone somehow decides that the city is a potential defendant, there's a liability protection for us that. That means we have an express indemnity against the dog owner if, if the city somehow is named as a defendant in such a suit. And, and absent that second point, which I, I take and understand the significance of, it, it isn't that adding this, it isn't that prior to adding this language, the dog owner had no liability. It, it just, this is clarifying it and addressing the second issue. That, that's correct. Okay. Um, there's also a limitation in, at least in one section in here, that talks about. Uh, not being able to have more than two dogs uh, per per household, I guess, essentially. The, ch the change that you're referring to, uh, um, and thank you for bringing that up, the old model ordinance that we adopted allowed up to two dangerous dogs per household. This, The ordinance amendment before you would allow only one dangerous dog per household. There's another limitation in the code that says you can have two dogs or two cats, or two dogs and two cats, excuse me, in your house. And if you want to have more than that, you have to come in for a permit. So you, you're not. Oh, I must have misread it. I thought it said that even with a permit, you couldn't have more than two and two. There's a gent, there's a, and I could see why that would not be readily apparent because there's a generic provision that says if you want to do anything outside what this ordinance allows, you have to come in for a permit. I see. So you need to read both pieces. Um, one of the other things that we added was a uh, provision spelling out, and I believe this was just in the context of dangerous animals, uh, required minimum liability insurance for a, the owner of a dangerous animal. And, right. and the rationale behind adding that was? That's uh, public protection. Um, we, um, the, hypothetically, you could have a dog owner with no um, liability insurance to protect the, um, the the members of the public from a dog that um, might be dangerous and and if they don't follow the provisions of the ordinance to, for public protection we wanted to make sure that anybody who had a dog remember a dog that's has that's been declared a dangerous animal's been through a hearing process and that dog has been declared dangerous so when that happens if you want to keep the dog in San Carlos you're going to have to have liability insurance to the satisfaction of the city. Okay. Um, and my last question is in section 604-140, where it talks about um, uh, restrictions on uh, future ownership. Um, the language that's in here talks about um, restricting ownership of the same species and breed for a period of five years. I thought that the latest thinking on this matter was that that if a dog ended up being declared vicious or dangerous, that it was more likely the result of the way the dog had been treated, and in that sense was sort of independent of the breed. It traced back to the human being, not, not the dog. So I was curious about why we, we have the approach that we took here. Well, we we um, that's a that's a provision that's um, we felt that it was important to to specify that um, because it could be uh, there could be a lot of scenarios where someone is focusing on a certain breed and we wanted to have the added flexibility to focus on on that, but it's something that you don't have to have in the ordinance if you if if the council believes that just identifying the the dog owner and having other dogs. Um, we could we could uh, remove that portion, but I think it felt stronger to me to have that ability to focus on a breed that that particular owner is having a problem with. Um, my issue with that, I understand that. My issue with that is that right or wrong, I, I, I what I was thinking of would require more redrafting, which would be to distinguish between dangerous and vicious. In other words, that that that. If an owner has a dog that's at the second level, which is vicious, that they be restricted from owning any dog for a period of time, because uh, a, a dog can be declared to be dangerous that you know that 
is dangerous, but it's not at the level of, of being vicious. So I'm not sure that's something I'd be comfortable editing on the fly. Well, you know, I was just talking to Greg about this. The way I read it, I think the word breed is actually completely irrelevant because there is, you know, if the species is canine, then <laughs> it doesn't okay. matter what kind of canine it is. Uh, okay. And Fair so enough. the way I read it, it actually, you know, species makes sense because you may have, you know, a vicious dog and we may say you can't own a dog in the future. Um, but, you know, we might be okay with a hamster or a parakeet. Um, fair enough. And, Greg, you're comfortable with uh, Judge Maltby's interpretation here? <laughs> That's what I was trying to say, but Jeff was more direct. We, we don't, you, you could delete the phrase and breed um, if you just want to focus on the species. And there are other species that could theoretically be dangerous, you know, that, that people keep as pets, too. So that would be... There may be other species that don't have breeds, for example. So I, I, I agree that um, you could delete those two words. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Bob? Um, thank you. I just had a question. Um, I guess Section 604040, uh, as there's dog licenses, not having a dog, I don't know what the rules are. Uh, what is the license fee for a dog? Yeah. Sorry. You know, I don't, I can't tell you the number off the top of my head. It's not very much. I think it's in the um, neighborhood. Terry, do you happen to remember? Or, uh, That's okay. I mean, it's like 20, 20 bucks. Yeah. 20 bucks okay. I was yeah. just curious. I didn't know what it was. That's all. Just... All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have one. I'm struggling with this difference between dangerous versus vicious. Is, are there legal definitions? Does the judge decide it? How do, how do you know? Well, uh, how that's decided is at a, um, an administrative hearing, and uh, the administrative hearing officer it could be the city manager or his or her designee, or a, we have a contract with the county of San Mateo to conduct hearings. It could be, in, but it's set up that the city manager can decide who is going to hear any particular matter. Um, vicious animals um, under our code, if a dog is declared vicious, it is not allowed in the city of San Carlos. Permit otherwise cannot be in San Carlos. The dog has to be removed from the city. Um, dangerous animals are allowed with a permit, and it's it's a matter of degree. Um, and there and the code has the the definitions of what the difference is. But generally, a, a vicious animal is one that's attacked a person or another animal and caused injury. A dangerous animal is more of a threatening animal. It's done something that has scared people, but it didn't really hurt somebody. I think that's the basic layperson definition. Kind of like the difference between assault and assault and battery, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Matt. Yeah, just a uh, quick question. The um, role of the animal services officer is when we read through this is uh, exactly what you talked about. If if you have an animal or if you get a complaint from, say, a neighbor or something, then to determine what that animal is, if it's dangerous or vicious? There's a preliminary determination by the animal control officer mm -hmm. uh, that that becomes basically a recommendation to the hearing officer. So if you had a, a, an animal control officer who was called out on, uh, made a call, that a, that a dog had bitten somebody, for example, um, the the animal control officer is the first officer on the scene. Um, maybe technically a nine one one call is made, and the police are there first. But the animal control officer is the is the officer in charge of the animal. They have the ability to detain animals, and they have the right equipment to to put them in their in their vehicle and take them to the um, SPCA facility where the dog can be impounded pending the hearing. The the hearing is actually a separate determination of whether the dog is dangerous or vicious. Hearing before either the city manager or uh, a hearing officer that the city manager designates. Okay, so if somebody owns uh, a certain breed of of dog, for instance, uh, 
and you know some of these breeds can get pretty expensive and then it's determined that it's uh to use the language you used before a vicious animal i think so now you have to get rid of your you, you can't have the that animal in the city anymore does does that person have recourse i mean let's say they spent you know twelve hundred dollars on a animal and now they're told you can't have that animal anymore um do they do they have any recourse in the courts or what they, yeah they would um someone could bring a writ and uh, make a claim that the hearing wasn't conducted correctly or they um it wouldn't have anything to do with the value of the dog it's just whether or not the dog qualified to be a vicious animal okay all right all right any other questions all right does anyone wish to speak on this item all right mr mayor i make a motion to uh Move to introduce ordinance. 1482. 1482, an ordinance of the City Council, City of San Carlos, amending and replacing San Carlos Municipal Code, <coughs> Chapter 6.04, Animal Control Concerning Dangerous Animals, Dog Owner Accountability, yeah, Liability, Fees, Insurance, or Licensing Requirements, Dogs in Outdoor Dining Areas, and Other Cleanup Provisions. And through the chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, there was a number of amendments that I, I mentioned um, I'm wondering if that's included in the motion, the, the amendments to the text of the code. I don't have any amendments. I, um, Did you want in, to make some amendments? In my, in my, just, in my staff I report, in my staff report, I was referring to about four amendments. Um, one was a text amendment. One was a and a couple of typos. Yeah, and then I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I apologize for the text and typo ones. Fine, but there are no other substantial. That's right. That's what I was talking one. about. Okay, sorry. With those inclusions. I'm sorry. All right. Um, would would my colleagues accept a uh, friendly amendment to delete the language, the phrase "and breed" from six point oh four one four zero? Um, okay. I'll make the uh, uh, opposite. Motion that Bob did um, with the with uh, with uh, the uh, including Greg's um, suggested amendments uh, and also including deleting the uh, um, two words and breed from six point oh four one four zero. There's a second on that. I'll give it a second. I'm looking at it. Um, just for clarification, Mark, what can you remind us again specifically where that language was? Yes, it's um, if you count the red lines, some of which have strike throughs, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh line down, or the third line from the bottom of the first paragraph. The, that line itself reads ownership of other animals of the same species and breed for a period of five years. And I would just uh, strike and breed, so it would read ownership of other animals of the same species for a period of five years. I apologize. Which section is that again? 6.04.140. Through, through the mayor, and I just add, deleting yeah. that language will have no substantive effect on the ordinance. So if the council wants to remove it, that's fine. It's really saying the same thing twice when it comes to breed. So, and I can understand the council's desire to not want to single out breeds you're really singling out species and owners. Yeah. Uh, then I'd be happy to second. All right. Okay. A motion in a second. Uh, Discuss, Matt? Yeah. Can we yes. discuss it? No. So, yes, so, absolutely. So I do see there being a difference because it's saying um, after opportunity for hearing and a finding of good cause, shall be subject to restrictions on his or her ownership of other animals of the same species and breed. That word end is very key because what it's saying is you, uh, if you just, if we change it, if we take that out and breed, then somebody who's, let's just, let's just quit hiding the elephant in the room here. <laughs> um, if somebody owned a pit bull and it was deemed vicious and it attacks, you know, because it attacked somebody downtown. They took it with them dining, you know, at town. 
and the pit bull yeah, got up and attacked somebody or t attacked another dog, now that person can't own that particular breed. But if they wanted to go buy themselves, you know, a, a Shih Tzu, they could because it's not the same breed, mm -hmm. but it is the same species. So I think we should be careful about taking that, that out. That is the, that's the, the difference between the language. I think that's well stated. Right. And just for clarification, the reason I'm proposing that is um, what I've read most recently, the thinking on this matter, is that the, the risk factors, it's not, it's not the breed per se that causes the risk. It's the way the, it's the human ownership of the dog. And um, uh, uh, that's why I'd like to remove the inbreed language. So it, it, if I can follow your comment, Mark, through the chair. Yes. What you're saying is somebody who would abuse a pit bull, for instance, to the extent that it becomes a vicious dog, could also mistreat a Shih Tzu. It's not going to become a vicious dog necessarily because they're just, it's not in their nature. But for the sake of the dog, not necessarily for the sake of the public, is why you're saying that. Well, it's, it's, for, the, it's for the sake of the public and the sake of the dog. Because you notice there's no language in here that talks about breeds that may be very hard to turn into vicious animals. Okay? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we, we can make this as arbitrarily complex as we want. I'm looking to try and strike a balance between simplicity and recognizing that, again, from the research that I've read, it's the human owner that's the culpable yeah, factor here. I see what you're saying. Um, and, okay. and I think your point about not having the dog be abused, a subsequent dog be abused, no, is important. You, 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 the discussion just pulled me back over so, because I wouldn't want to see somebody who abused a pit bull to the extent that it becomes a vicious dog own any dog. Right. Yeah. All right. Any other discussion? All right. I believe we are voting on Mark's. Motion. Councilmember Grisilli? No. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. All right. I guess that means we don't, that's it, right? We don't vote on the next one. Okay. All right. Um, moving on to item 9D. This is a consideration of approving, approving a resolution amending compensation provisions of the city attorney's personal services contract. Mr. Mayor, I'm going to leave the room while you're considering this item. All right. Thank you. Well, since, Gre since Jeff has started making legal interpretations, maybe we can, you know. <laughs> I will be presenting. I'm not allowed to until he's actually right. out of the room. Does he have to close the door after? <laughs> no, he does not have to close the door. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of City Council. Jeff Maltby, City Manager. Uh, before you this evening is a contract amendment for your city attorney. As you're uh, aware, the council uh, reviewed uh, Mr. Rubin's performance as part of their uh, closed session uh, recently and uh, gave Mr. Rubin's a, a, a very favorable uh, evaluation. Uh, Greg is asking that his contract be amended to uh, include a cost of living adjustment of 2%, uh, which would apply both for the reta retainer uh, portion as well as the hourly uh, service rate and adding language that in the future uh, his contract be adjusted uh, for cost of living uh, each year in association with the same uh, cost of living adjustment, uh, if any, uh, that is granted the management uh, unit of this city. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Any questions? Y yeah, I have one. Um, the retroactive language, mm. can you give reason for why that's in there? Yeah, um, uh, I think that language or the uh, date rather just mirrors his last uh, adjustment uh, from a year ago. And as the council might remember, this was on a couple agendas earlier uh, in the year and the council uh, meetings just ran late and the council had rescheduled the evaluation, pushing the, the process back. So any, any time, uh, you know, granting that is, you know, obviously subject to the uh, council's discretion, but it would be, uh, 
it would be in line with other similar decisions the council's made uh, in the past to keep the contract on the same timeline and uh, adjusted. The, the, uh, I, I know it's it's very short time frame, right? But uh, the concern I have, and you, you could please comment on this if you would, just. The, the idea of retroactivity, then when we get into, uh, you know, big employee groups con negotiating, we've always, it seems to me we've always had a policy of not doing retroactive, especially, you know, now, again, this is like almost a few days, but it's still the same policy. And when we are negotiating contracts and we get into three, three four months, six months, then it really is an issue. Through the chair, could I make a comment, please? Sure. Uh, I think the city manager, uh, Mr. Grocott, really hit the nail on the head. We pushed it back. Well, if we, we had did. voted on it, yeah. we wouldn't have this issue. So I, yeah. I don't disagree with your comments, but I think we pushed it back. If we hadn't pushed it back, I think there's a lot more to talk about. But I really believe that since we did it, I think it's only fair to, you know, we would have voted on this in a, in a much more reasonable time. Yeah. And just to, to answer your question real quick, Matt, um, you know, we I think it would always be the city's position in negotiating formal labor contracts that we would not do that, mm -hmm. um, subject to how the process goes out. Because in negotiating a formal labor contract, obviously you're dealing with the union, and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot outside of the council's control. Whereas negotiating contracts with your city attorney or your city <laughs> manager, um, you know that tends to be a very quick back and forth process. And so, you know, for, you know, you look at something like this instance, it's really the reason it's arriving to you now has just has to do with agenda timing as opposed to sort of a contract holdout and a prolonged negotiation, which would be where that would be the major distinction I would draw. So for, for your sake, Bob, I, I raise it as an issue just so it's out there. So it doesn't look like we're setting some other kind of policy. But I understand what you're saying. You're right. It was, it's all in our hands, but just so it's clear. Okay. All right. Any members of the public wish to speak on this? Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt Resolution 2015-13. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending contract for personal services, parentheses, city attorney. Second. All right. Motion and second. Any comments? The only comment I'd like to make is that I think we're lucky to have Mr. Rubens. Um, we've seen comparative analysis. Other cities spend a lot more on city attorney services, and we've gotten solid counsel for many years. I'll second that, too. Okay. Uh, Crystal? Councilmember Casilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. <laughs> okay. Item 9E. Uh, consideration of adopting a resolution declaring a drought emergency to implement the water conservation enforcement measures under Municipal Code Section 8.10, effective March 10th, 2015. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. My name is Tara Peterson. I'm the Assistant to the City Manager. And before you this evening, we have uh, a discussion and recommendation to consider declaring a drought emergency. So um, we are in the fourth year of the drought. Currently the Sierra snowpack is about 88% below normal. While December 2014 was very wet, January 2015 was the driest and hottest in the Bay Area ever recorded. Uh, as of the 1st of February, we've had a little bit of rain since then, um, local water storage is 58% of maximum, and total system-wide storage is 55% of maximum. The, SFC, uh, the SFPUC does not plan to restrict water use at, to its customers in 2015 beyond the 10% voluntary cuts that are already in place. But they will be revisiting this in April or May uh, after the rains have ceased for the winter. The city of San Carlos and its residents and business have been asked to reduce water use by 20%. And fortunately, according to Cal Water, we are currently meeting that goal. 
but every community and water agency should be considering next steps as this drought continues. Uh, we do have some partnerships. We partner with Cal Water, who continues to take the water waster reports, investigate them, and educate wasters. And there's also BASCA, which offers a lot of programs um, to encourage conservation. Lawn Be Gone is one of the programs that they oversee. In November, Council passed Ordinance 1479, which established water conservation measures in the time of drought or emergency, which uh, gave the city some tools for enforcement of water restrictions. But the ordinance requires a declaration of a drought emergency by Council to implement these measures. Some of the penalties for the violators include $100 for the first violation, 200 for a second violation within the same year, 500 for each additional violation within the same year, and each day a violator continues to the unlawful action, he or she is guilty of a separate offense. Impacts on the city. Uh, departments that will be enforcing this ordinance have indicated a need for additional staffing and additional resources. Uh, direct costs will include a hotline to take reports, providing outreach materials to educate the public about this new ordinance and the new restrictions and the consequences, uh, some costs for travel to investigate uh, some of the complaints, and developing and printing of citations. Staff plans to return to council uh, with a request for funding if council does elect to move forward this evening. So our recommendation is council consider declaring a drought emergency to activate the enforcement measures of Ordinance 1479, effective May 15th of this year. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'll entertain any questions. We also have Mr. Tony Carrasco of CalWater here with any specific questions that I might not have the information for. All right. Thank you, Tara. Um, wow, we've got a lot of people want to have ask questions. Mark, I think, was first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, do we have a, uh, uh, two questions, do we have a rough sense of what the enforcement costs would be, Jeff? Um, a very rough sense, I would say $50,000 or less, including marketing material. You know, there's a lot of postage and mailing, that kind of thing. Uh, I think our, what we're going to do is explore through the county who we contract for code enforcement services about uh, the addition. And then it's really ultimately going to come down to once it goes into, once we've done the outreach and it goes into effect, how many cases do we really have? Um, and that's, you know, that's going to drive the cost. Uh, I would assume that even if the cost is high, it'll fall off rather quickly uh, once enforcement starts. So. Uh would it be staff's expectation or plan to uh, discuss some kind of cost sharing arrangement with CalWater? Oh, we could certainly do that. Those, those are my two questions. All right. Thank you. Um, Bob? Um, I, I'm confused, but what's new there? The last slide says uh, effective May 15th. The staff report says March 10th. I'm sorry. What are we, what are we, what's the difference here? No, you're absolutely right. Um, as we investigated a little bit further, we realized we did need to do a little bit more homework to come up with some numbers. And also um, the thinking, for me anyway, um, Jeff could weigh in, but is to give us a little bit more time to see how things shake out with the rainy season. Okay, so if we, if we uh, adopt this resolution, it'll be May 15th, 2015, not March 10th. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now I understand. All right. Uh, Cameron. Um, so Bob kind of asked the question I was going to ask, but um, why, why do we declare a drought now for five months in the future? Why not just declare the drought when we're going to enforce it? This gives us a little bit of time to order citations and get a process in place. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, is is the intent of staff that um, we publicize the action? If, if, let's say, imagine we take the action tonight, right? So, so is the intent of staff that we then, you know, publicize it? Presumably, it'll be in the newspaper or other places. Uh, city council declares a drought, and 
here's here's you know what what you should do um, to conserve water, even though you know the the drought is not effective for five months in the future. That seems a bit odd to me. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering. Excellent point. That does give us some time to do some outreach. We would probably send out flyers or postcards. And so that'll take a little bit of development plus mailing. So that does give us some time because we think education really will be key to the success of this program. Well, but, and, but why couldn't we just declare that there's a drought today, which there, there clearly is, and then you do the outreach subsequent to the fact that we declared it? Essentially what you're doing is you're doing two things. You would be declaring that there's a drought tonight, but the um, enforcement measures would be effective May 15th. I see. Okay. All right, so so the okay, so those two things are, are clearly separated, you would say, and that, that so we're declaring a drought and we're saying we're not gonna enforce it until May. Right. Okay. Staying on the same line of questioning, couldn't couldn't uh, things be put in place, all the things you're talking about doing, ordering citations, et cetera, all that could be done without declaring a drought. Oh, absolutely. We could inform people about the ordinance itself without declaring a drought. It's just that none of those uh, enforcement measures would be in effect. But they're not going to be in effect till May 15th anyways. So that, that's what I'm confused on is why, uh, why, why not wait until the water department does what it's going to do in April and so forth or May and, and then you know, we see how the rest of the winter goes and so forth. And then declare, you know, if we want to declare a drought, let's do it in, in May or in April or, you know. So I, don't, I, just, I just don't understand the urgency right now. So the reason that we're asking the council to declare tonight or to, there's no magic to tonight, but have a, a separation between the effective date and the declaration is so that we can actually say, this is the decision that the city council has made. These are the things that are going to go into effect on such and such a date, the watering restrictions and those kinds of things. So we're publicizing to the public, you cannot do these things uh, effective May 15th. If we wait until May 15th and you pass the ordinance, then you know, you're either, we wouldn't necessarily be telling the public now. We think the council might consider putting these restrictions in place on May 15th, but we don't know. But what about that dreaded day, April 15th? <laughs> right. What, what if, no, so seriously, because I see what you're saying in part is once you pass an ordinance, ordinance it still takes 30 days to go into effect. So, so if we waited till April, but the thing I'm looking at is, you know, yes, we're in a drought. We're in a four-year sequence here. Um, but we still don't know how the winter is going to shake out. I don't know that anybody does. And, you know, if you've lived in California long enough, you know that uh, some of the biggest snowstorms we get are in February and March, some of the, you know, rain and snowstorms. Yes, the snowpack's down right now. Is it going to be down in, you know, in May? We, we don't know yet. Because the winter's not over. The winter in, you know, California, up in the mountains especially, doesn't really end until, you know, sometime in late April, early May sometimes. Matt, so. if I may, can I, can I just ask a follow-up question to that? If, if, if we were to declare a drought today and then, um, you know, February, March, April turned into the biggest water years on record, um, what, what might we do? What what, we, what would staff suggest, with, that we suspend the, the drought emergency? Well, we certainly can come back to council. If things, if things do change dramatically mm -hmm. like that, yeah. I think it would behoove us to come back to council and say, these are the new facts. What do you think? And well, I don't know if you covered this or not in your presentation because I had to step out of the room, but if, if at any time the governor were to rescind his declaration, of a drought emergency statewide, that would automatically rescind ours the way our ordinance is written. Yes, either the Cal Water or the governor needs to declare a state of emergency. Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think what we're talking about here, I mean, for me, is 
as we've all recognized, we are in a drought right now. We've been in a drought for a while. That's why we adopted the ordinance uh, a few months ago. Um, in good conscience, it's not the kind of thing, because it's a, it's a relatively significant change, that we would suddenly slap on people and say, by the way, you're subject to fines starting tomorrow morning. So whenever we make the effective date, we're going to want some time between when we adopt it or trigger it and when the effective date is. And to me, that's what staff is admittedly perhaps a little less than ideally clearly is suggesting, that we, we declare the emergency now and we start our normal process of saying we're going to work with the community so that when, when the fines are actually potentially going to be levied, hopefully we will never have to levy any fines because everybody will know, okay, this is really serious and we need to save water. Um, so that's how I, I look at it. And if we were to defer the decision until after the winter, we'd still put a, the same 60 or 90 day shot clock on it. And then we'd be 60 or 90 days further out. And, and I personally would rather not do that. Uh, Cameron? Just one additional question. You mentioned there was a representative from Calwater here. I just wanted to hear uh, is, if Calwater is supportive of the council. Um, Declaring a drought emergency. Good evening, honorable mayor, council members, and staff. My name is Tony Carrasco, district manager for California Water Service Company. Um, we are very concerned about our current water situation, obviously. Um, we I'm going to say we as a whole community in the peninsula has done a remarkable job on conserving water thus far. Um, we, I, just, I was at a presentation last week with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and they're um, concerned but optimistic. Um, this last storm was nice, but we need about 10 or 15 more of these uh, to continue. We're very supportive of any programs that are going to help educate our customers. And uh, I think we have a common goal here, and that's to, it's, it's long term. What the, whatever the city decides to do, we're going to fully cooperate with them and, um, and support that decision and work with staff on a daily basis so that we can, again, achieve the, the, uh, the same goal as we all have. And that's uh, our future, uh, just really making sure that we can, uh, that our customers understand even in wet years that they need to conserve and really change in the culture. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Okay. Matt, did you have a question of Mr. Carrasco? Uh, no, not of Mr. Carrasco, just okay. of uh, staff. All right. So this is similar to the question I had under the dog ordinance or animal ordinance, whatever. Um, in this case, if you it talks in here about an appeals board, uh, so if you lose that appeal, what's your recourse then? Oh, that would be a legal question. There would be there's a once the process in the city is exhausted, um, and if someone still feels um, that the uh, that they either their rights weren't upheld or, or that if there was something about the, the process that um, wasn't fair to them, they could go to court. That would be the next step after that. So they'd take the city up on a writ saying whatever the city did in, in, in implementing the ordinance um, from their perspective is inappropriate. But, you know, I, I think the, um, the process is going to be either finding or notices of violations and then a hearing. That's how it's going to be. If we if we get to that point, there's still discretion to um, to give warnings. If it's um, something that uh, is not chronic, somebody's not repeating the doing it. They just get a warning, and that'll be part of the the education process. But only after all that happens is we we might need to go into the full enforcement. Uh, and I don't know if I answered your question, but um, that's how. First of all, citation education. Then citations or administrative hearing, and then if if they um, still feel aggrieved, then they would have to go to court. So what? Why that? Why is that uh, step necessary of a hearing? 
it, here, here's my, here's, here's the way I look at it. I get, you know, I'm driving down San Carlos Avenue and I get pulled over for a, some kind of traffic citation. I go to traffic court. I don't go to, you know, I don't sit in, in uh, Captain Rothhaus's office with the city manager and Jay Walter because, you know, I'm on a public street and have a hearing for the citation. I go to traffic court. Why in this case do I go to... Councilmember Grocott, um, I just pulled up the ordinance while you were um, bringing up the, this point. Um, the appeals board um, is for if someone were, here's how it would come up in a citation standpoint. Someone got a citation and they would say, wait a minute, that's not fair because of my personal circumstance. So they could come to the appeals board and ask for exceptions. So for instance, um, they have a, um, uh, maybe they have a, uh, a, a spa that has a health issue in it. And one of the restrictions is you can't refill your spa. So they would come in um, and say, I need an exception. So they could come and there'd be, a, there'd be a, a place where they could go for an exception under those circumstances. Uh, I, I'm trying to, in my mind, think of where someone would have an exception for you know, watering or the, without a cutoff valve on the hose, but but the some of the things might be health related, or or you have a um, you're getting your swimming pool remodeled. We have we'll have there's a prohibition on refilling your swimming pool, but we felt like it was important to have a process that someone could come in and say, you know, I really I've got a crack in my swimming pool. It needs to be resurfaced because I'm wasting more water than if I just if I fixed it. So there would be a, a basis for. Um, getting relief from the code. Uh, and then primarily the, the enforcement mechanism is going to be the, the county enforcement officer that we've hired giving tickets. All right. Um, well, I've got a couple questions. Um, I was wondering how they arrived at the fines. I mean, at setting the fines. Is this is this Taken from other model ordinances? Yes. Well, as, as uh, California um, has a provision for general law cities to impose fines, our municipal code has a, has a fine schedule for first, second, and third offenses within a period of time. So we've just incorporated those fines. So it's sort of a pro forma that yeah, we follow. That's right. Okay. And then the other one is, are, are we getting many calls from residents complaining about other residents using too much water? Not lately, um, but we've always referred them to Cal Water, so it okay. might be something we'd need to ask Cal Water. Anything? It was it was more so during the summer months mm -hmm. that it has really uh, kind of tailored off in the last couple of months, um, and they were they were to be honest with you, they were very difficult. It was after the fact. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't have all the information. We do have a couple of different mechanisms to receive the information. And a lot of it was, well, last night I had seen this, or early this morning I had seen this. I really don't have the address. So it was very difficult. Um, it, but it's, we don't get as many of them today. But we had a very good December rainfall. And um, so I, I, and not a lot of people are watering. Right. And that's generally when you're doing them. Where you're getting a lot of them, so it's really tater law. I can't give you the exact number. That's, that's yeah. all right. Uh, my, my last question for you, though, is um, between today and the end of the rainy season, what percentage of normal rain? You said we need 15 storms or wh whatever that number is. Would we need 200 percent, 250 percent of normal rainfall in order to get back to a non-drought situation? I mean, what what is is there a number that the governor would finally say this this emergency is over? Yeah. So I'm not too sure what the governor's office uh, would say because they're looking at the whole state and there's other reservoirs uh, that are really low. There's other areas that are extremely low. And for the peninsula, uh, currently we're over 100 um, percent of normal. Um, we need to be much higher than that. What we'd like to see, according to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, 
is to have about 150% of normal. If we were to have 100% of normal and very good snowpack, they would continue with the 10% um, throughout throughout next year, uh, voluntary uh, reduction. They feel very confident about that. Um, so, so again, what we're really looking at, and it may take a couple of good years to get out of out of where we're at now. We have quite a few reservoirs that are at 40 and 30 percent. So to get those built up, I would say at least 150 percent of normal. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, does anybody wish to speak on this matter? I don't have any speaker cards, but I want to ask. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Tara. I move to adopt resolution 2015-14, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos declaring a drought emergency to implement the water conservation enforcement measures under Municipal Code Section 8.10, effective, what are we saying? May 15th. May 15th, May 15th 2015. Second. All right. Motion to second. Any discussion? There's uh, one area that I think might need some discussion, and that is um, Mark had brought it up about the fines. And while I don't necessarily see a situation where somebody might do something day after day after day, I suppose it could happen if... Uh, you know, you had a water leak or in your irrigation system or something, and you're not at home, and you don't know, and you can't fix it. Uh, that could get, you know, because ap after the first offense and then in the second offense and then the third offense, you're at $500. If, if uh, that was over an extended period, that could get quite high pretty quick. It seems to me there ought to be some type of uh, maximum amount put on that, not just left out there. So, um, Matt, or, I don't know, Greg, you want to? Uh, Councilmember Grocott, um, I have, um, you know, I, I have the, some discretion in, in enforcing it, and each offense in this particular ordinance is going to have to be cited separately. It is possible that there would be a situation where I would feel as the city's prosecutor that the person is ignoring all efforts to get compliance with the code and they really are wasting water. And, and it could be a number of different ways that they're violating the ordinance. It might not just be the leaking hose. It could be they're doing this, they're doing that. They're, they're just ignoring all the provisions um, that um, are uh, incorporated into the ordinance for conserving water. I could have that kind of situation. I could also have the situation you described. If someone went on vacation and their, one of their sprinklers popped and it's in the evening when they water after six and they're in compliance otherwise that um, it has the appearance of wasting water. Um, I would make an effort in, under those circumstances to obtain compliance. That's the goal of this type of an ordinance. It's not to be punitive. Um, so I would look at the facts and circumstances. So it wouldn't necessarily accelerate to the $500, but, the, but as a tool, as a prosecutor, you want to have that ability to get someone's attention who is not otherwise voluntarily wanting to comply. And the way the ordinance is set up, I might add, is it's referring just back to our general penalty section in our code. Every infraction that I would charge as the city's prosecutor would have that same mechanism. So I, I, changing that part of the code would be more difficult than the resolution that you have before you tonight. I appreciate your answer. I still think that uh, having some type of cap is only fair because uh, I, I hear what you're saying. You, you probably wouldn't allow it to get to you know, a point where it's an inordinate amount. But the fact remains, what's in writing is what's in writing. There is no cap and uh, that exposes the public to uh, the possibility of a penalty that's inordinate with the uh, cause. Um, Matt, if I may, um, you know, what, we're not debating the ordinance. We already passed the ordinance, so this is really just whether we want to trigger the enforcement. Yes, so e even, even if 
you could get support for that idea. It's not agendized tonight. Um, so we could, you know, if, if you want to pursue that, we could bring it back at a subsequent date. And just to add for your peace of mind, if it helps, Matt, um, that provision of the ordinance hasn't changed in years. So any code enforcement violation could rack up like that. And we've never had an instance where that's happened. Matt, I'd, I'd like to give you a real life experience. We went on vacation about well over 20 years ago during the last extended drought, and we did have a leak. And we came back. We didn't know it until we got back, but our water bill was huge because we were gone, I don't know, 10 days. And the bill from Cal Water was, was just huge, but there was also a mechanism in there, and maybe Tony can tell us if this is still in effect, that after that, for obviously we got the leak fixed. <laughs> after that, for every month that we stayed below whatever our uh, baseline was, we got a credit, and it took six months, but I actually got that excess surcharge uh, credited back over about six months because I knew what the baseline was, and we stayed under it for that period of time. Now, I don't know if that mechanism is still in effect, but we, it was the last time we had that six-year drought in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but I, I, maybe Greg can speak to whether or not there would be something a little bit uh, more flexible for uh, a person who did. And I guess what you've said is that um, if it's a clearly a situation where there was, it was an accidental thing, there wasn't willful abuse of the, of the, uh, of, of the water restrictions, that there, there's some relief in the, in the law for that. Is that right? I, I think that's where I would have discretion as a city's prosecutor. Um, I also have discretion on the, on the second and third offense, should it ever come to that, um, those the the first one says a fine not exceeding one hundred dollars for the first violation. Second is two hundred dollars, not exceeding two hundred. So I have some discretion in setting the per diem fine, if you will. It doesn't have to be the maximum fine. It just has to. It, it can go up to the maximum fine. All right. Uh, time to call the question. Councilmember Silly? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. All right, moving on to item 9F. Um, consideration of adopting a resolution supporting participation in a feasibility study of the Community Choice Aggregation Program for San Mateo County. Tara, once again. Yes, once again. Saving the best for last. So, um, good evening, Council. Uh, Tara Peterson, Assistant to the City Manager. We're here to discuss community choice aggregation. And with us this evening, we have Mr. Jim Egemeyer, and he is uh, the Director of the Office of Sustainability with San Mateo County. And he'll talk more about this program. Good evening, Mayor. Council members, staff, and council. My name is Jim Agemeyer, and I am the director with the Office of Sustainability with the County Manager's Office. I'm here tonight to request the adoption of a resolution authorizing participation with the county and other cities in a technical study. And um, also to provide a short PowerPoint set of slides here. I have about a half a dozen. Um, and uh, first, I'd like a little disclaimer, and um, that is Lean Energy is the county's consultant that we've hired in this um, endeavor. And I just, th this is a set of, of um, slides that we've been using, or they've been using at um, our outreach to city councils and, um, and other officials in the county. So, um, and then also on behalf of um, Supervisor Pine, this was his initial idea a number of months ago, and in turn he is at um, Burlingame tonight and was not able to attend, and our consultant is uh, Lean Energy is with him up there. So with that, uh, I'd like to jump into a number of slides. The, the thing to focus in here is that what we're providing or looking into is a community choice, and this is um, kind of a... Um, state legislation allows the formation of a CCA. There are three CCAs in the uh, state of California, uh, Marin, 
Sonoma and Lancaster is about to go live with their CCA right now in Southern California. So with the choice, we're also um, the ability to provide greening to our uh, electrical grid, offering consumer choices, and also uh, boosting local economies relative to that because of the choice locally. So this is how it works. Um, we're able to pool communities, cities, and the county together to essentially purchase and then develop power locally on behalf of the residents, businesses, and municipal facilities. It's keeping it local. This is a, a graphic that helps us understand how our partnership continues with PG&E. So in a CCA formation, you have a joint powers agreement in which they purchase and also build potential electrical supply locally. And in turn, it's delivered through the pg and system. They maintain that. They continue to maintain it. Is it a partnership with them that continues? And ultimately, at the other end, the customer, the counties, the city, and residents. So um, with that, what we're able to do is we are responsive to local environmental and economic goals. Our local environmental ones are really formed around our climate action plans that we've all been working on for a number of years and looking to implement. This is one way in which we can lower greenhouse gas emissions. Economic goals locally offers the consumer choices where none currently exist. So this is in competition to PG&E's rates. It is revenue supported and the taxpayer is, has no um, subsidies involved with this at all. And what we've seen is in the past with Sonoma and Marin is that it's able to offer stable, cheaper um, electric rates. And that's based on their particular circumstances. And we'll be studying that as the potential for ours. It also allows for um, rapid switch to cleaner power supplies and significant greenhouse gas reductions. So it is more on that line of thought relative to what pg is offering or will be offering in the future. And then it also provides funding for energy efficiency and innovative energy programs like energy storage and EV charging stations because the joint power agreement keeps that locally and revenues can then be looked at projects locally to then supply the power grid. There are risks associated with it, and we've put them in basically into four categories. So rate competition and the market fluctuation. So the way I understand it, PG&E has the ability to raise their rates according to their circumstances. With the CCA, what they try to do is go out and buy long-term and short-term um, contracts and kind of keep it stable for a particular period of time. And the model has shown that it's relative to a year that um, CCAs are kind of, kind of getting in and setting their rates for a year's period of time. So um, they're able to hold it at that level. And then there's also the customer opt-out. So with the formation of a CCA, the customer is automatically put into this CCA formation. But there are customers who opt out, and they provide or they consider that they want to continue with the PG&E system and what they're offering. And there's also a political um, risk associated with that, essentially relative to local policy objectives and trying to find kind of the balance between um, appealing to both progressive and conservative minds, making environmental and business cases. So it in turn has um, kind of a political side or could be at um, the formation of a CCA. And then the last is kind of more at the, the um, higher level, at the state level, regulatory and legislative aspects in which they, um, the legislation relative to CCAs. And there was one, uh, AB 2145, that had um, some traction, but um, ultimately was not passed. 
So the next steps that the county is taking right now include um, continuing our outreach effort in, to increase our database for people, um, stakeholders, people who are involved and wish to understand this particular CCA concept. And, um, and then we're also uh, returning to the Board of Supervisors um, at the end of February. And in that, I'm going to be requesting the um, allocation of monies to move forward for our technical study. And what we're asking from cities is indicating your interest by an authorization electrical load data for the CCA technical study. And it's... A, a rule from PG&E that we have to seek out and obtain either from the city um, manager or the um, city council the adoption of a resolution allowing further information to be released from PG&E to our consultant for the technical study. We're also looking to help identify key stakeholders or groups in your area as we continue our outreach effort and we're looking for um, attendance at our CCA briefings and participating in future steering committee if one's formed. And um, for this initial phase one, we're looking at um, absorbing the cost for this particular study so there will be no anticipated cost to the cities for our technical study. And with that, that concludes my presentation and I hope to <clears throat> obtain your support for the adoption of a resolution tonight. Thank you very much. Um, can you remind me your name one more time? Jim Egemeyer. Right, thank you, Mr. Egemeyer, for your presentation. Um, questions? Mark? Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, Jim, thank you for the presentation, which I uh, appreciated. Uh, just a quick question, um, uh, and I was out of the room in the very beginning of your presentation, so I may have missed this. Where does the funding for your organization come from? He's with the county. I'm with the county. Oh, I know where that money comes from. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, let me uh, you know, try and save myself a little embarrassment here by, by shifting the scope of my question. Uh, where, where does the funding for rolling out the CCA concept come from? Is it each county, county by county basis, they opt in and say we're going to allocate some of our budget to this? And um, I personally don't know how Marin and Sonoma came into existence. Um, our consultant was um, a mayor with the um, city of um, up in Marin and um, in turn was very involved with the steering committee and the formation of that and that there was some um, initial support um, from um, uh, private entities that funded the initial um, efforts within um, up in the northern part of the Bay Area. And um, so what we're looking to do here for this is um, the county's participation is, is going to be um, funded here at this first phase. There are three phases associated with it. The first one is a technical study. At the completion of that, we're then going to be asking ourselves, do we want to continue in working for or moving forward and going into phase two, which would be the formation of a JPA. So at that time, then we're going to be looking for partners or bank systems that might be able to partner with us to help us in the initial cost to get started. So all of the costs associated with the, um, the startup of a CCA is recoverable through the rate payers um, and what they pay. So we'll be looking to um, essentially um, return that money or the loan from the county, in this case for phase one. Phase two would be a much larger amount because of the, the initial formation. And then working with the bank, what we're able to do is initiate the first um, 60 days is what I'm understanding because they have to be first converted over the CCA, consume the electricity, bill the electricity, and then pay back to the, the JPA. So the bank helps us move through this bridging aspect. The working capital. Right. Essentially. So um, it, it sounds like that depending upon how the JPA gets structured and you know, assuming it moves forward, that there might be a situation in the future where, where the county would, would consider approaching the cities um, to contribute something towards getting this started, or is that? 
Too early to tell? Or? Too early to tell. Okay. We haven't even, internally we meet every week and in the formation and moving forward with this and that concept and that thought has not even crossed our minds because the county is really looking to, a Supervisor Pine and Supervisor Groom are really at the, uh, the forefront of this idea and moving through and really finding out, getting down into the technical study and really finding out what could be the, the uh, positive benefits and making that decision to, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you for helping me recover from that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cameron. Um, the formation of the JPA, what, how, how is that done legally? Uh, does it require a vote of the people? Does it require a vote of the individual um, cities that want to participate? You know, how, how's the, what's the mechanism for creation of the, the JPA? The way I've, I've heard both um, Marin and Sonoma and the way they formed their uh, JPA was around um, looking to their city councils, who wanted to participate, and then with that, then working with council and essentially um, figuring out the mechanism for um, involvement in the, the JPA. Okay. And then um, what is your sort of rough timeline, do you think? Is this uh, one year, three year, five year? What? What do you, how, how, I know the process has just been kicked off, but can you share yeah, the rough so, timeline? So, yeah, um, so what we're looking at is um, the completion of our first phase, so that's the technical studies, and, and then returning to the Board of Supervisors um, with that information in um, the, I believe we were saying the fall time of this year, and, um, and then let me see where that is, my staff report. Yes, it's, it's September, and September, October, um, roughly returning with a technical study and information in order to see if we're going to be proceeding into phase two, and then also our outreach to the cities with that information as well. And so, um, and then after that time frame, it's roughly um, what we're thinking about is getting into the fourth quarter of 2016 is um, when we'd be looking at... Um, Go live, David. Yes, okay. if we go through phases two and three. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Bob? Um, uh, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but a lean energy, I assume, is the consultant? Yes. And they, you indicated we have to authorize the electoral load. That's why we have to do a resolution. They'd be the ones that are going to be analyzing these numbers and... <laughs> No, oh, okay. not, not Lean Energy. Um, Lean Energy is very effective in their outreach. They are not technical consultants, okay. and so we'll be uh, uh, issuing, we're working on an RFP right now okay. in, relative to the technical aspects. Okay. Does Lean Energy continue on with this program, or is this just their outreach and then they disappear when we set it up? Do you know? Um, and again, I apologize, because how would you? You may not know, but I'm wondering yeah, if... Um, We've had a very good relationship with Lean Energy because of their background and knowledge of this right. in no, the I'm formation. So I, I would want to be trying to retain them through my office sure. through the formation of this. Certainly through the formation, yes. but after it's formed, do you anticipate? Okay. We, right. Because essentially what happens is the JPA right. is formed and they essentially um, hire staff. Right. They could theoretically hire them again, but... That's true. Okay. So right. I'm just trying to understand the consultant concept, right. which tends, sometimes can go on know until we're all right dead. paying for consultants yes yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you okay appreciate it uh, Matt <coughs> thank you uh, so the you, you talked earlier you had a slide about the risks but for what you're asking us to do tonight there's virtually no risk at all right right yeah and yes. then the the last thing I was gonna say is if you don't go back to your boss and tell them that Mr. Olbert's property tax needs to be raised until he understands where the county gets his money, you know. <laughs> Are you listening down there, Mr. Yes, Robert? please, please. My, my, uh, with my new house, my tax bill is already higher. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Agamire. Thank you for your time. Uh, All right. Um, we do have a, uh, a speaker card, uh, Gladwin D'Souza. Seems like we're pretty popular with Belmont these days. <laughs> Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. I'm Gladwin D'Souza from Belmont, and uh, 
I'm chair of the San Carlos and Belmont Sierra Club. The Sierra Club has been a strong supporter of CCAs since we helped with the enabling legislation in 2002. We see it as a way to reduce your greenhouse gases up to one third according to a study from S City of San Mateo. And we see three positives for the city. One is uh, providing more choice to your constituents. The other one is reducing rates, especially for businesses. And the third is getting um, more of, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thoughts over there. Um, and uh, we are really fortunate in San Mateo County that Supervisor Pine and Groom have taken the lead on on helping us get to a CCA. The, it, it was a painful process in Marin. It took quite a while in, in Sonoma, and I, I think the effort that San Mateo County is doing is going to help us get to this solution much faster. So th thank you for your attention to this matter. Look forward to your ordinance. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt Resolution 2015-15. 15, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos expressing support to participate in a feasibility study of a community choice aggregation program for San Mateo County. I second. second. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion, a second. Any discussion? And a third. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm very supportive of this um, program. Uh, you know, Many of us and many of us in uh, the Bay Area and many of us uh, in the country and around the world are con very concerned about climate change. Um, oftentimes the city um, tries to do things to um, help reduce our car carbon footprint um, and we focus usually on um, city facilities. You know, we put in LED lights, um, we've put in um, other things in City Hall to reduce uh, uh, electricity usage. Um, and that's important and it shows leadership, but it has a relatively small impact to the overall problem. Um, you know, it's rare when we have an opportunity to empower residents, businesses to um, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, the EPA says that electricity generation accounts for about a third of all um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we see anybody who walks around the peninsula, drives around the peninsula, sees um, people making green choices all the time. Um, if you're concerned about greenhouse gas emissions um, for vehicles, you can buy um, an electric vehicle or Prius or uh, a hybrid, et cetera. People are doing this because they're concerned. Um, you can see solar panels on roofs. Um, but for most people, if you're concerned about electricity generation, the only choice you have is to put solar panels on your roof. And if you're a renter, you can't do that. And if you're um, there's lots of other reasons why that might be infeasible or too expensive. And so this offers a really simple way for people to um, have choice. And uh, at large, uh, if, this, if, this, if these types of programs are rolled out across, the, across California, across the country, um, it can have a huge impact in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are generated from, uh, from electricity. So um, I'm very excited, um, uh, I hope, We'll see how the vote turns out, but I'm very excited for us to be taking uh, a lead in the county on this. Um, I think it's a big deal, um, and uh, I think it's going to be important going forward. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I won't repeat all of Cameron's sentiments because I agree with him. I, I, I think this is, offers a bunch of wonderful options, assuming it actually comes to fruition for our residents. Um, uh, I do hope that... Uh, uh, assuming the vote turns out successfully tonight, that uh, staff will make sure that this gets incorporated in our communications outreach to the community about even at the early days about what's there. And uh, finally, the only other thing I'd say is, which I suspect, Jim, that you already know, is you guys really need to come up with a better name for, for, for the program because uh, particularly the one the st you know, the state uh, is sticking it with community choice aggregation. It's like, what the heck does that mean? So. All right, Matt. Just a couple of comments. Um, first one is you had mentioned in your presentation about appealing to both progressives and conservatives. Well, I'm the conservative. You probably could tell that by watching our council meeting tonight. Um, and I do think this has a, a big appeal. Um, I, I don't 
believe in global warming. I don't care about climate change. Um, but to me, it just is common sense. You know, and when I was in high school, I took architecture classes and I did this project where I designed a solar home. Well, that, I was in high school in 1977. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just amazed at how far solar hasn't come in that time period. Obviously, in 77, people knew about it, but just really hasn't gone anywhere. And I suppose a lot of it has to do with economics. But it's just, you know, it's refreshing to see stuff coming around and going in this direction because it just makes sense to use solar if you can. Um, to, you know, we had the guy here earlier and he was hitting on some of the regeneration projects that they're doing. And I think all that stuff's wonderful. Um, so I'll vote for this it's a it's a it's a good project Bob? um we supporting this project um i think we all should um realize that anytime we have options it's a great idea i think it's going to get our, our local public utility um off the dime a little bit and maybe get them uh working on a lot more uh, uh alternative uh, energy sources um but, but but realistically let's not kid ourselves that uh this is a panacea to um, solve all the problems. And even though the costs are lower in some of the other issues, you, as I, we had it, um, I think when I went to uh, uh, CCAD that night, we had a, uh, uh, substituting for Mark, we had a uh, 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 something given to us. And depending on how you pick, it can be more expensive. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, uh, because you get to choose how you want to do it. So. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody has their eyes open on this, that it, it's a great idea for options, and I think it's going to be terrific uh, uh, analysis, but it may not be uh, like 40 or 50% cheaper. It might be uh, just as expensive or whatever, but it is going to be better for our society and for our environment, I think, no, no matter what we do, go with it. And again, I think it also will get pg and off the dime, to be quite blunt. All right, great comments. I'll just say I'm excited that the, the movement toward energy uh, efficiency is gathering steam. So. Crystal? Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Mayor Collins? Yes. And with that, I believe we're adjourned. Is that the only 5 0 vote we had tonight? I think so. Could be.